Yeah. Okay, we're going to start, guys. How are you? That's great. So for the next about two hours, I'm going to open the door into my world, what I've been doing for the past 16 years now, you know? So I want to send you all the energy possible if you want to get into my world. I want to tell you how to do it, how to go and exchange properties, and the tool set that you need, you know, to you know, accomplish everything that I have accomplished that is possible to do. I'm excited to be here, you know, and uh, I want to tell you that when I went through the MBA program, 2012, we went to Singapore and China, study, did our thesis, came back, and then I set up my brokerage company in Torrance. And I want to tell you that at that time, I didn't have the opportunity to meet investors or professionals like myself at that time that can guide me and give me some mentorship or internship, you know, in my industry. So now that I'm so involved and have been in the industry for over 15 years, I want to make sure that all of you get all that opportunity, you know. So we're going to have a, a fantastic session today. And uh I usually begin by getting to know each other. You know, I want to see who you are and why you're taking this class. I know there's one of eight, right? One of how many? We have 12 total. So we have 12, you know? So if you're taking this class today, this lecture, that means that you're super interested in my world, you know? Because it's an elective, you know? This is not like a mandatory class, right? So it's, it's an honor to be here in front of you and give me the opportunity to get into my world, you know? So um, how many of you are in uh, finance? Okay, so maybe 45% um, of the class. How about accounting? Accounting? I mean, I love accounting, by the way. Entrepreneurship? One. How about other disciplines that I haven't mentioned to you? Like, just curious, which one? Economics. Economics. So Dr. Son? Um, Have you taken him? Not yet. I highly recommend him, you know? Well, yeah, I can as well. Economics as well. Okay. Have you taken Dr. Now? Not yet. Okay. Who else? Uh, computer science and data, data analytics. Fantastic. Your brain is uh, very advanced. <laughs> so the way that your brain works, you can do so many models that when I talk to you about how to go out, about exchanging properties. And today we're gonna learn all the fundamentals. Just to give you a little uh, foot, foot note on, on my world. You know, there's the brokerage market, right? And 75% of brokers do not know, do not know anything about 1031 exchange. Okay? That's a high percentage, right? So when I saw that, like a quarter of the market, 25% or less, I said to myself, you know what? That's my niche. That's what I need to learn more. So today we're gonna be learning about how to go about the fundamentals, change properties, and I'm gonna show you some transactions that I have done and uh, the benefits of doing, you know? So you in computer science, finance, accounting, you can build models. Everything that I'm saying, you can quantify, you know? And that's, for me, that's the exciting part, you know? How about you, what, what's? Uh, management. Management? Yep. So have you taken uh, Kelly? I haven't taken Yeah, Yeah, she's fantastic, by the way. Who, who are, have you taken? Uh, with management, uh, Dr. Ensure, Dr. McGrath. Oh, okay. Uh, Dr. Gutierrez. Oh, Gutierrez, You're excellent as well. Um, who else? Uh, how about you? Yeah. Marketing. Marketing. Ooh. Uh, David, right? No, uh, what's, what's the director's name uh, in the marketing uh, department? Who's your professor? Oh, I miss that girl, but she's new. She's really oh, I see. She's new, yeah. Uh, how about you? Computer. Fantastic. And by the way, marketing, something else to keep in mind, guys, that Real estate is all about presentation. You can have your skill set, right? Finance, accounting, computer science, you can build models. But if you don't know how to market and express yourself to persuade someone to believe in you, it doesn't matter the skill set that you have, you know? So those two go hand in hand, 
connected. And we'll talk about um, the actual pillars of real estate into the one exchange, you know? Anybody else? Who did I miss? How about you? Awesome. Marketing, okay, and you? Oh, marketing as well, so um, I have an affinity with marketing because it's your brand, you know? Like whatever industry you're gonna get in, it doesn't have to be real estate, by the way, it can be any, any other industry. You need to brand yourself, right? So you have to have that reputation. So important, you know. As you know, in, in, in uh, brand branding, as uh, it, it means the world. You know, you need to build brand equity about your brand, right? But so this is who I am. I've been a, a broker since uh, 2001. So I took my state examination before I got into the MBA program. And once I went to the process of the MBA, I went ahead and uh, established my brokerage company, Torrance. So I've been practicing commercial real estate and industrial real estate for the past 15 years. So these are the items that we're gonna be talking today. And we go all this uh, today, but uh, I just wanna get a feel of you, why you're choosing real estate and what's interesting, which, what type of real estate are you interested in, in purchasing or becoming an investor, you know? Let's start with you. Well, not sure yet, but uh, I was looking at property management and yeah. uh, investment properties. Okay. That's a way to get into it. Good thing about sure. I wanted to, uh, prop, how, how many of you guys uh, heard about property management? What's so beautiful about property management is that you can have that steady income on a monthly basis, right? It doesn't matter if uh, if you make a sale or not, you know, you still have those renters so you can collect a management fees on that. How about you? Like types of real estate? Yeah, and interesting investment, uh, multifamily, uh, industrial, warehouses. Why are you choosing this class, by the way? This 1031 exchange uh, class? I mean, it's like the foundations for, you know, um, scaling and stuff. I mean, if you have a certain amount of equity and uh, in a property, you know, scale it up and just keep going, going, going. You just keep, keep going. going and up, yeah. You can defer that capital gain when you sell into the next one and the next one and the next one. You can do that forever and pass it to your next generation as well, you know? And so what's beautiful about my world is that you can learn about the fundamentals and the rules that you have to abide. But once you learn that, it's, it's, it's like a, that they give you a key to the kingdom, you know? Remember what I told you that like 25% of the industry knows about a 75% do not, you know? Because there's a lot of nuances when you do that. And we'll talk about Airbnb today, which is a hot topic in the past six months and uh, why investors are doing that as well. And, you know, the difference between uh, having an investment property through Airbnb, how much can you rent it for in the time, and can you use it for personal use? You know, we we'll learn that as well, and we can connect that to the three one exchange as well. How about you? What are you real estate? I'm just curious to be completely honest. No like, problem. Since I'm here. Yeah. yeah, that's that's what's your main finance. Finance. Are you thinking about perhaps as an analyst, you wanna? Have some uh, a career in the beginning, perhaps? Yeah, I mean, I'm trying stuff out. I've done like private wealth management. Now I'm about to do private equity this coming summer. So oh, is that right? I'm trying to, yeah, I'm trying to figure out what exactly I want to do, but I do know that real estate is something I know legitimately nothing about. And I mean, you I have to say explanation. Do that. That's excellent, by the way. And I encourage all of you guys to, whenever you have an opportunity to have an internship somewhere or a shadow someone. Go ahead and take that opportunity, you know? And uh, by the way, at the end of the class, you know, you guys give me, give me your information that we can uh, talk about internships and so far, you know, but uh, that's the way to do it, you know, because at this stage in your career, your career already began since like before school, by the way, before you, you became a, a freshman, you know? This is just another chapter in your career once you graduate, you know? So basically it's good to know which, what you connect with, you know? So. It's so important to uh, to be happy when you go to work, you know? 
to always be connected to your colleagues and uh, and also make money, right? Well, so it, it's, it, everything is a balance, right? So this is what I just described to you. I feel that on a daily basis, by the way, you know? But it, you have to make those decisions early in your life, your career, right? You can make it in later on as well. You can change careers, you know? But that's my recommendation, right? Having said that, uh, let's take a look at this uh, uh, three pillars that I have here, you know? If you guys connect to these three pillars, I connect to these three pillars, that's what makes me happy because this is who I am, I work. What I feel so far from you, you are here as well. Can you do the honors, you in the middle? Can you read the first one? If you like real estate, if you like real estate investment, this is one pillar that you already satisfied. It, it's, it's in you already, you know? How about the next one here? Can you read this next one? Yeah. Fostering entrepreneurial spirit, a driver for opportunity. Right. So if you, your mindset's more about how I can create a business, right? you have a driver for opportunity let's say for instance you want to become a broker and have your broker's firm you have that entrepreneurial mindset right how many of you said that you're in entrepreneurship taking those classes you know uh, why you chose entrepreneurship uh i think it's something that has been fostered throughout my entire life right my mom is a career, so she just kind of instilled those values and kind of just go on to live more. Like it's not necessarily just in business, but in terms of like sports, uh, like the Indian aspect of life, just going on to live more. And by the way, this is a whole different way of looking at the world, by the way. You know, you can still have a, a job in a company, wealth management, a private equity, have a position. But you can still have that entrepreneurial mindset, you know? You can still do your investments and have your, your job that you have, you know? Or dedicate 100% into, into doing real estate investments, you know? But if you have this mindset, I can assure you that there's so many opportunities that you'll see at all the at all time, you know? How about the next one here? Uh, you in the back? Of financial engineering. Achieves investment value uh, by optimizing tax liability, reducing financing costs, and increasing cash flow, and unlocking the market. Right. All of us in this class, we are we are in this area. We do financial engineering in your classes, your homework, for your learning. This is who we, all of us who we are here, you know. How many of you that raise your hand can connect with uh the first one, real estate investments. Okay, most of you. How about this one here? Entrepreneurship mindset? No, okay. By the way, you can develop this. You don't have to have it in your heart yet. You know, you can, as you go along your career, you can you can develop that. You can see the opportunity somewhere, you know? And trust me, you will have the opportunities. You, it doesn't matter what's happening in the, in the industry, in the market. Don't worry about interest rates going up. Don't worry about changing interest rate going down. If you see an opportunity, can you grab it? Okay, I'll talk to you guys about how to go, perhaps getting a loan, you know, how to structure a deal. But it's so important, if you see opportunities, you go ahead and take it. Like, I know that none of you guys are afraid. We, we're brave, you know? And we have a whole lifetime, to, you know? to make decisions later, but if you have an opportunity, by the way, when I say an opportunity, what do you think I mean? It could be anything. <clears throat> Give me an example. An example of an opportunity um, could be you see a market that maybe isn't experiencing growth right now, but you can see a trend in the future that more people are gonna come to this market and that it's gonna increase in value. You got it. And you just have to look, sift through the clues for that. You got it. Welcome guys, how are you? Uh, What's your name? Uh, Robert. Hi, Robert. 
we're all discussing why real estate, why choosing uh, this class, and what do you like about real estate, Robert? Um, for me, I think it's like the combination of so many different aspects of life. You kind of need that knowledge to get you all trades. So um, I only want to like live myself doing one thing for the rest of my life, being able to combine different fields. Everything you say, I connect with you, and all of us connect with you, by the way, you know? All of us, we are in one group today to learn how to take our skill set to the next level. I can assure you that by the end of this class, you're going to learn so much about 1031 Exchange that you can start making that deal tomorrow if you have an opportunity, you know? How about you? Do you connect with financial engineering? Yeah. Why? Can you, did you guys hear what you said? I mean, I know what you said to increase your cash flow. I mean, my goodness. Can you imagine you have an apartment building for two units, four units, 10 units, 20 units. The rent is still, let me ask you this. Whatever rent you're paying today, do you think that rental rate was the same like a year ago? How about two years ago? How about five years ago? I can assure you that rental rate is going to keep growing, increasing, right? That owner, that investor is increasing his cash flow or her cash flow, you know? So if you know how to do your modeling, if you know how to uh, compare, and there's a different matrix that we'll talk about today about comparing properties as well, based on transactions that I have done, you're going to increase your cash flow. It's, it's guaranteed. I can assure you of that. So I'm gonna get a little bit on my personal level right now. I made a decision more than 15 years ago that I wanted to become a broker. And instead of going to a large broker's firm, nothing wrong with that, I highly recommend CBRE, Marcus and Milling Shop, DRL, you can learn, take, take that experience from them into your career. But I chose another option in my life. I chose the option to sit on my own brokerage company. I did that since day one, my brother. I was very focused on what I wanted to do. I wanted to increase my cash flow. I wanted to make investments. But I also was proud to say that the place where I'm going to establish my organization, my company, I want to own that building. It's a different mindset, by the way. When we talk about entrepreneurship, it's a whole different mindset. I mean, think about this for a moment, right? You become a broker if you choose to do that. And by the way, whatever career that you choose, you can still become a broker. Go through the process, take all the classes and, and, and have that that license, you know, to kind of benefit in your career. But I made that decision that I didn't want to go rent. I didn't want to go rent. I wanted to buy my office building. How many of you are in Torrance or in the South Bay area? Any of you? Where do you guys live, by the way? Do you live near near uh, campus, most of you? Torrance is like about 10, 12 minutes from here, not too far. It's an excellent area, by the way. You know? See my address here? When I became a broker and I had that, I, I was focused that I wanted to purchase my office building. I didn't want to go rent. How am I going to raise the capital? Like right now, as a college student right now, it's not that easy to raise capital, right? But I realized that when you become a broker, what do you get at the end of the transaction? When you represent a client, let's say I represent you in a transaction, and we sell this building or we acquire this property on your behalf as a broker, how do I get paid? What do I get? Commission, right? Everybody gets that, right? What's the percentage on the commission that we get? In one, in one in three. Right? One in three? One in three, that's if you represent the buyer. How about if you represent the seller? That's right. Same thing, add it up. 
Simple math, two and two, three and three. If you are the owner of your broker's firm, who gets all that commission? That's right. Do I need to share with somebody else? Nothing wrong with sharing, right? I just want to give you my own experience, why I became a broker, when I, why I set up my own broker's firm, and the focus that I had about purchasing my office building, raising capital, right? How did I raise capital? How many transactions did I do? Three. You can do five, you can do six, 10. Doesn't matter how many you do, right? But save that money, right? Save that commission. Because what did I do with that commission that I saved? What do you think I did? That was my down payment. By the way, what I'm telling you right now, these are facts. This is something I did. I own this building. This is like one hour ago, uh, I'm sitting here in my <laughs> office <laughs> doing my calculations, talking to clients. This is this is my second home, you know, but I'm proud to be there. You know, I'm, I own the building. So when I tell my clients coming to my building, let's talk about this investment, you know? So it, it, it's, it's, it's a whole different mindset. Nothing wrong with go renting an office space as well. Nothing wrong with that. But I just want to tell you that it is possible. Anything that you put in your mind is possible to do it. It, it. It's not impossible. You know, you see all those people that any of you live in those 100, 200 unit buildings near campus? Any of you? Have you realized that somebody owns that, somebody owns that property like a syndication? Right, it can be a group of investors. You can set up an LLC. Why do they have that? I don't know, right? You, you can own that building. You can own that 100 unit building, 50 unit building, right? It's just You have to stay focused on what you want. You know? So that's what I did. So my 65% that I did, how did I get the 65%? I applied for an SBA loan. Simple as that, right? And I put a down payment, so I purchased this building. I'll give you a little bit of feedback. My dad's uh, an engineer. He taught me all everything about financial engineering, plus what I learned at LMU as well, you know? So I learned how to do financials, projections, my p &Ls, all my reports. Remember what I told you guys that he sold up our presentation? What do, you, what do you guys think about my collateral when I purchased this building? I applied for a loan. My dad helped me with the financials. What do you think the bank said to me about why are you applying for this loan? Show me your collateral. How much collateral do I do you have? You know how many properties I had at this time? You know how many clients I had? Can you imagine? Think about this for a moment, right? You have 35% down, you're focused on what you want to do. We're an expert in doing financial modeling, right? But then they ask you collateral. They ask you for a backup, right? We need to have some backup. The bank's not going to just approve so much money, right? So it's all about high, how I, it's all about presentation, right? How you present yourself. You can, whatever you build, be able to articulate and convince someone, you know? What I just told you right now, that's, a lot of wisdom, I want to tell you. So important, you know? You in the back, what do you think I'm trying to say when I'm telling you about present yourself? Representing myself? Yeah. Well, it's, it's sort of like selling yourself off, in a sense. You're trying to create trust to whoever's letting the money and be able to not default on that one. That's right. Trust. You say they have to believe in you. Right? Remember, we talk about reputation. Make sure your credit is fine. You know, they have to trust you. You can have all the financials in the world. You can also have all the money in the world as well. If they don't deny, it's very subjective, by the way. I, I, wanna, I learned that so through the years of doing so many loans, representing clients. It is subjective. One parameter in one bank is different than another bank. Remember that. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's what I did, you know? They asked me, what's your collateral? I mean, when it, he asked me that question, I just, 
I just went like like cold. I, I thought I, I just it like like somebody threw me in, in cold water because I'm ready, right? I don't have no collateral and I don't want to be denied. You know opportunities that I'm telling you? Whenever you have opportunities, take it. So and somebody sometimes you need little luck as well, you know. So the SBA representative for the bank, the, the VP of the bank. Okay, Mr. Asensio, you don't have collateral. What we can do is we can set up your corporation, our corporation, and that's gonna be your collateral. But that means that if you don't pay your mortgage on time, if you default, we're gonna take your business. So my corporation C, corporation C is my collateral. It's still my collateral as of today, you know? Actually, I'm always paid the loan in full, by the way, which this is something I'm super proud, by the way. I don't expect you guys to pay your loans, you know, whenever you buy property, but this is my baby, right? This is this is my second home. So I'm proud to say that it's, it's almost free and clear. Thank God, you know? But yeah, opportunities, right? So he went ahead and approved my loan. The moment that I approved my loan, I saw a listing on Torrance Boulevard. And I said to myself, oh my goodness, this is like a, like perfect, right? I'm in the city of Torrance on Torrance Boulevard. So easy, right? On the main boulevard. So it, it's it's possible to do it. That you stay focused, right? What you want to do, you know? Just curious, uh, you know, what kind of real estate would you like to purchase? Um, residential. Residential, what type? Well, it's duplexes, stuff like that. Yeah. And I, I just want to tell you, uh, do you guys know on a macro level the difference between residential, commercial, then you have your industrial? Do you do you know the difference, generally speaking? Any any of you? You what do you think is the difference between residential and commercial? Oh uh resident, generally speaking. Residential is like homes and everything, and commercial, there's a bunch of different types of commercial, like you're saying. Industrial, there's uh, office, there's hospitality. Yes, yeah. that's right. You, he, he's correct. So, residential from the banking perspective, residential is up to four units. It can be a condo, duplex, triplex, fourplex, right? But it goes into five units, it goes into commercial. Yeah. Uh, accounting, who's in accounting again? When you do depreciation, you know, the way that is separated is residential, 27.5 years or depreciation. And when it's com uh, commercial, 37. 37, it, it depends on your CPA, 37 and 39, yeah. But that's the major difference right there, you know? In accounting, you know? In banking, is up to four units. So in commercial, you have subsectors, right? So you have your residential, right? Your houses, condos, duplexes, right? You have your commercial under that umbrella, that category of commercial, you have your subsectors, right? So you have your industrial, your right, office space, right? Storage, right? And you can have like, let's say Tesla owns this warehouse over an acre. Right, that's part of an industrial, but it's in, under the umbrella of commercial. Get it? So, residential, commercial, and then under commercial, you have your industrial office space storage. Get it? Yeah. With multifamily housing, I've heard some people give different definitions and classifications of whether it's um, residential or commercial. And some people say, like, if it's four units or less, it's residential. If it's more than that, it's commercial. I was just wondering. How you define that line? That's an excellent question right now. Man. So from the uh, accounting perspective, right? Your CPA will be 27.5 years, right? On apartment buildings. That's gonna be your residential. Residential apartment building. This is from the accounting perspective, right? Residential accounting building, residential apartment building, and then commercial, Sometimes 37 years, sometimes 39 years. Depreciation. 
So that's that's the big major difference right it there. It depends on how long it takes for me to appreciate. Exactly right. Yeah. But but it's gonna start depreciating from day one, by the way. From day one, the day the day that you purchase that building, that's that's day one of your depreciation calculations that you do, right? Day one to 39 years. And by the way, this is an important subject, which is uh, something we're gonna be covering today because this is what is called recapture depreciation, right? So depreciation is a benefit that you get like a write-off. It's a write-off you have in your tax in your taxes, right? So depreciation is like your best friend. So when you exchange properties, all that write-off that you have, you have to recapture that. So let's say you purchase a property, let's say 2024, and you sold it in 2030 for 10 years, right? So all that 10 years of depreciation, you took advantage, and then, of course, you did that calculation based on the 27.5 years, right? So the day that you sell that property, if you don't do a 1031 exchange, you have to pay over 20% taxes on that recapture depreciation, ouch. And I'm gonna show you a slide right now, I mean, a few slides later, as far as all the taxes that you need to pay if you do not do a 1031 exchange, when you sell the property. By going back to my example, so so this is, uh, how many of you guys would love to, to buy an office building? Why? Why do you like office? And by the way, just to let you know, uh, office, that sector office now, as you know, there's a lot of vacancies, the market has changed, like tremendously. We'll talk about the reasons why, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Well, I mean, I don't know too much about real estate, but I would like to You're right. office building. That's what the purpose is. And what's beautiful about it that I hate to say this, right? But when something's from not right in the economy in some sectors, it's an opportunity for somebody else, right? You know, imagine this, 35% down, right? Let's say, hi, welcome, come on in, welcome. Let's say you have about 200,000, right, in the bank, right? And then you wanna go and make an investment and you love office space. When is the best time to purchase? When the prices have reached so much or when there's a lot, a lot of vacancies? Right now, it's happening as we speak, like right now. You know, you drive on the main boulevard, you'll see a lot of vacancies. The, I think the rate is like about between 40 and 20%. That's that's humongous. Like five years ago, the, the vacancy rate was less than 5% in so office space. You know? I know it would be better because it's cheaper to purchase right now, but it's harder to find pensions. So how do you get that investment? Up? So that's part of your entrepreneurship mindset, right? You have to have a niche and find a mark. You have to market that building to the right way so you can find that rent there, right? Because you know, some people are doing conversions, obviously. He's right, that's right. A lot of my friends, and I think that you, I don't know if you met Paul, but uh, you guys came to the panel discussion that we had last year. My friend Paul Miskowitz, he, uh, that's what he does, which is a, a building, office building. He converted it to condos or he converted it to apartments. Either way, it's, 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 a, it's an excellent decision because you can sell those condos later or just keep those apartments and re rent them. You know, so yeah, that's 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 the entrepreneurship mindset, right? Excellent. <laughs> so we have two new students coming in. Hi, how are you, ladies? What's your name? Hi. Hi. So, what year are you guys in? Sophomore. We're talking about real estate, uh, why you chose this class and why you love real estate. All of us, we're going to learn so much in the next hour and a half as far as exchanging properties. And I'm going to show you all the fundamentals, how to do it. And what type of real estate do you guys like? Commercial? Huh? I want to go into private equity for commercial real estate. You got it. It's beautiful. Beautiful. By the way, just a, a little footnote also. If you, I'm gonna invite you guys to come to the panel discussion at the end of this month, by the way, we're gonna have Hilton 100. But um, one of the panelists is connected with private equity 
and the investors of this private equity firm that they established purchase a bank. And the bank now is lending money to multifamily investors, by the way. It's, it's fascinating. I mean, I want to encourage you guys to, like, if, if that's your world, if your world is fascinating to be in that world, by the way. But, um, I have a question regarding conversions because that sounds really interesting. Like, hypothetically, right? If you bought up all the empty office space in San Francisco, because there's a whole lot of that right now, what would you do? Oh my God. What would you convert? It? Oh my God. Well, first of all, the economics have to make sense, right? The economics, right? When I say economics, meaning that, what do you think about? Think about for a moment, right? You have an office building that is empty, three, four, five story building, right? Regarding, when I say economics, meaning we plumb the property, the electricity, put it up to code, right? So what is what, what do you think is more economic, more beneficial, and less expense to purchase that empty building in San Francisco, right? This is what private equity firms are thinking. I'm, when I'm telling you, my friends are thinking this way. This is the way they analyze these properties. This is a fact, okay? Do you think that they're making a decision on a newer office building that is empty or an older apartment building that is empty? I don't know about it. The older, right? Yeah. You're right. Why? Buy it for less. Keep in mind that you can resurface the property. You can hire an architect to re-engineer the property. So face it. At that point, you're just flipping office. At that point, you're exactly right. So when you do, you're gonna be converting. Once you, you don't have to demolish the property, right? right? You can still keep the foundation. But same process that you will do in an older building, you do it in a newer building. Right? But you can purchase that property cheaper. The expense is gonna be the same, right? Got it? So, I mean, the opportunities right now are, just go to San Francisco, you'll see the opportunities. Just go to YouTube, right? You can see all those videos, right? All those empty buildings, you know? It doesn't have to be San Francisco. It can be anywhere in the US, you know? As long as you know what kind of, what's gonna be the market that you wanna get in, you know? Good question. You had something else? Another question? Uh, I was just gonna Size. Insulation, right? Yeah. Okay, I mean, you're right about it. there's there's so many codes that you can uh, so it's satisfy. It gets complicated, right? So you have to redo the the, the windows and so far. That so you'll go, go through that process when the property is new or old, right? So there's a lot of opportunities right now. Older properties, you know. But this is this is a uh, this by the way this is a new trend. This is what's happening in real estate, office space, you know, in that world. Question: Is office space that sector is the part of residential or commercial? Got it. Excellent. Thanks for paying attention, guys. So this is the reason why a lot of my clients are making decisions to exchange properties, you know? They have a lot of equity in their buildings, you know? The valuation have increased. And this is this is what's beautiful, right? What we talked about. The new report here tells you that there are higher rents. Any report that you'll see from 2023 and this year, there's an expectation that rent is going to keep increasing 5 to 10%. So this is, you know how like right now rates are very, the interest rate are very high, like 7%, 7.5%. Four years ago, it was like 2%, 3%. The, so this is the way that you can offset the cost of that loan because of the higher rate, you know? 
Do you mind if you do the honors? Uh, if you read this one, if you don't mind. Starting at higher? Uh, yeah, higher, yeah. Higher runs is helping offset the higher cost of financial deals following Fed rate hikes. Right. So that, that's the reason why a lot of my clients are exchanging properties. Because why would you exchange a property if the rates are so high? You know, this is one way that you can offset. You always see the, an opportunity, you know. This this slide, I keep updating the slides like every year, every six months, and it, it just blows my mind what has happened since 2021. Chris, remember the first uh, lecture that we did here? Yes. The rates were like in the 0%, 1%. This is what was happening in 2021, right? Any of you, okay, so uh, I wanna make sure that we're on the same page. Cap rate, what is cap rate? Capitalization rate is net operating income over price, and it basically tells you what you can expect to earn in your thing. So what's the formula? The formula is very simple, right? The formula, right? Net operating income. Net operating income. So you get your rents, right? Or your income, gross income, right? GSI, gross income, right? Minus expenses, reoccurring expenses, right? So we have gross income, GSI, minus recurring expenses. What's left? Okay. NOI, right? Right? Everybody? We're on the same page, right? Gross income minus expense, recurring expenses equals NOI, right? Net operating. So just divide that NOI by what? Or you pay for the property. That's your cap rate. It's simple, right? I mean, that can stay with you forever. So this is how you can compare properties. This property is four unit building, 10 unit building, 20 unit, my cap rate is four. This one 4.1, this one 3.9. You see, it's a simple calculation, right? But you have to put things in perspective, right? Little things like that stays with you forever. And then investor come to you and say, oh my God, you know a lot. You know? Then you can start building your brand, right? based on your financial engineering. Can anybody tell me what's cap rate? What's that calculation? Uh, NOI divided by property value. Right. And how do you get that NOI? Uh, you take the like, PSI and then subtract that by the operating expenses. That's it. It sounds like fancy. I remember the first night somebody told me about cap rate. Ooh, that sounds fancy, right? But that's, that's, that's what cap rate is all about, right? <laughs> We speak that language on a daily basis, by the way, as a broker. That's what we talk about all the time. Cap rate, cap rate, what's the cap rate here? here? So you know, based on those variables, GSI, recurring expensive, NOI divided by price, right? All those variables, then you can make the adjustment up or down, right? GSI up 20,000, maybe the GSI is 30, maybe the GSI is 10, you know? That, NOI is higher or lower, you, you see the, it, it affects the cap rate, right? So that's how you make decisions based on your risk appetite. You know what, this area here I love, living close to LMU, I wanna buy a property in Westchester, right? Prime location, so I'm willing to pay more for the properties, right? Cap rate, maybe you pay more, a higher cap rate than a lower cap rate, right? You guys took the, the, the fundamentals, right? Uh, all of you took the first two. How many of you guys have taken uh, more than one class in the certificate? Okay, so you learn you learn more about as you go along in the, in the program. But uh, but I, what I just told you, it's a uh, it's broker talk, you know. So keep that in mind. It's very simple. What's cap rate? How do you calculate cap rate? Uh, I don't know why, but, but... that's it. And how do we get NOI? Uh, right. Because NOI is it's a simple calculation, right? But just from that simple calculation, you can be you can make so many strategies. You can build models on that. You know, all of you who are in finance, you know, start thinking like that. Yeah. Sorry. So no proper property value, is it what you paid or what it's valued at? It depends where you are, right? In life, right? Or talking to a client or evaluate a property. So if it's a property you bought today, 
is the price you pay today. Right. They say you haven't bought anything, right? You're just looking at property, look at what they're selling the property for, right? Think about this, right? If somebody's selling that property right now for, let's say, 1.2, right? And they hey, give me a hundred thousand reduction, 1.1. That's money in your pocket immediately because then your GSI hasn't changed, right? What has changed was your your sales price, right? Right? Yeah, um, when you're making that GSI calculation, yeah, does that primarily or always just come from the rents that are coming in or are there other forms of revenue? This is when the entrepreneurship mindset, entrepreneurial mindset comes in, in play. So the answer is no. You can include other parts of the business. In an apartment building, do you guys wash? Is that a washing machine? Is that a laundry room? That's laundry income, right? That's also part of your GSI. So GSI plus laundry income minus expensive NOI. See how beautiful that is, right? So you can start buying a property that has a laundry income, right? How about storage, right? If I some cabinets, you know what? This cabinet, I'm gonna charge $30 per cabinet, $50. That increases your GSI. See, this is this is how you think, right? When you start evaluating the property. So look what was happening here. So we talked about cap rate, right? What's the opposite of cap rate? What does it say there? Anybody? Cap rate compression is the opposite. What was happening in 2021? Hi, welcome. How are you? 2021, my business was on fire. COVID. A lot of bad things were happening in the market, right? A lot of people were hurting, right? But multifamily investments was on fire. Why? Because of cap rate compression. What was happening in the market about the rates in 2021? Were well, the rates high or low? Interest rates? Low, right? Low, right? So what, what happens when you have low rates? The value went up with the property. All my clients were sitting pretty. You couldn't raise rents because of COVID, right? But the price, the price of the property appreciated exponentially in a in a year, in a year and a half. I, I can tell you so many examples, which I'm gonna show you one, but property that I value, I evaluated. Uh, seven seven hundred twenty thousand during COVID in six months went up to one point five. Like, can you imagine? So my client went ahead, you know, and let's do a ten thirty one exchange, you know. So he sold that property in Torrance four units, and he purchased a property in Sherman Oaks and another one in Crescent, right? He purchased two properties. So that's the office of cap rate cap rate compression. So that was happening in two thousand twenty one. Look into twenty two. The Fed increased the rates one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times. That's that's devastating for the real estate industry, right? Seven times, right? And as you know, the mortgage is like connected to the thing you're gone, right? Look at this. Seven rate hikes in one year. I mean, that's that's it's it's insane what happened, right? This is 2022, right? I just want you guys to put things in perspective, right? 2023, last year, how many rate hikes? Anybody? Four, right? You're right. So it went up 1%, right? 2022, same rate hike, four. And the reason, what is the reason that the feds were increasing rates? Anybody? So you can start on the economy to fight inflation. That's right. That's right. Temper inflation. That was the mechanism they, they were doing. So inflation was high. There's increased rates. So it can decrease from like 5% to 4.5. Now it's like under 4. Right? So actually, they did accomplish. Unfortunately, who hurt which industry got hurt? Real estate, right? All the sales, we call it 
sales velocity. So keep that, that word in mind. Don't just say sales or you sold something. Nasty, right? But this is something that we're going to learn so much new terminology. Sales velocity, right? It decreased, right? Less, less transactions. And that's the reason why. But look what happened after July. The pets met already in September, November. Also, they met on uh in December. And what day today? February 2nd. So on January, two days ago on Wednesday, they met again, January 31st, and they passed it. So they haven't raised it's a pause. What do you think is gonna happen in 2024? All right, generally speaking, why have you heard any of you? Well, the election. Right? Elections gonna happen, you know. We don't want to get political here, but do they want to raise rates? Probably not. They pause, right? So there, there's a projection that they're gonna have a 25 basis point reduction, right? After Q3 or Q4. It's a possibility. So all of us at broker, we cannot wait. I'm telling you, there's so much, so much opportunity and Movement is going to happen this year. I mean, we can ask broker in the brokerage uh, industry. We cannot wait for that moment to happen. The moment the bets start decreasing at a quarter basis point, you're going to see so much action going on because I have a lot of clients ready, sitting, having money in the bank on a CD, making, let's say, three and a half, four percent, ready to pull that money out, invest, you know? So anyway, I just want you guys to put things in perspective. You know what, what's happening? And the rates are connected to the values as well, you know? So let's see. Uh, can you read, you man, uh, the top? What is the exchange, 1031 exchange? A process of postponing capital gains tax on the sale of real estate asset or business property by means of proceeds to purchase or replacement Okay, so now we're going to start going deeper now, okay? So we're gonna be postponing gains. So you've been selling two units, you gotta buy four units, you're gonna sell four units, you're gonna buy 10 units. If you don't do a 1031 exchange, you have to pay capital gains. So 1031 exchange is the method to defer, not to avoid, okay? It's a big difference, right? To defer those taxes for the future, right? But it's important that this part is, is mandatory. That transaction that you do, whenever you're ready to exchange a property, that money, that profit that you make, welcome, how are you? That profit that you make on that transaction, something simple, right? Simple. If you sold a property for 500,000, 500, and then uh, you sold it for, you purchased it for 500,000 and you sold it for like 700,000, what's the profit? 200, right? Just to put things in perspective, right? You have to pay capital gains on that, right? But when you do a 1031 exchange, you cannot have access to that money. You have to hire an accommodator. So an accommodator is a neutral third party that's gonna be the all the funds on your behalf. So if this is mandatory. This is another career that you also can have, by the way. You can also become an accommodator. You can make five, six percent, or you can have a flat fee. Remember, I just told you right now, there's going to be so much sales velocity this year coming up after the risk, if the risk reduced, that all these clients, all these investors, they're going to need an accommodator because they cannot hold the funds on your behalf. Yeah. So you can make money and become an accommodator. Ah, have you guys heard that? Oh, go ahead. Oh, that's a good question. You mentioned yeah. this earlier. Um, when you do a 1031 exchange, is it only a one-to-one -one exchange or can you exchange for multiple properties that are like kind of more? That's right. So you're right. You can exchange for more properties. That's not to be one. It doesn't have to be one. That's not to be doing one. And right now we're going to, we'll talk about the rules, how to go about it and, and how to make those decisions. You know, you can do one for two, one for one, but the sales price, the value of the property has to be equal or Above, okay. Okay, so 
you have to sign an exchange agreement with the accommodator, empowering that accommodator to go ahead and, and do a transaction for you, okay? So this is a just a sample of the exchange agreement. The reasons why clients, investor, or yourself, right, want to perform a 1031 exchange, this is the reason. I have quantified these seven benefits. These seven benefits are not just based on words, right? It's based on an analysis that I have done. Why I can do those seven benefits based on numbers, right? This is just not based on, uh, I like this problem, you know? I can quantify this. This is, this is what I have developed, that niche that I told you in the market that I have. This is the reason why clients come to me because they tell me, Edgar, you know what? I don't care about more units. I only care about a better location. I'm in South Central. I want to come more West, you know? Or I'm in Lancaster. I want to come to the Valley. I'm here in Westchester. Maybe I want to go more to Santa Monica, right? Or newer building, right? Can you, you, can you do the honors? Can you read number three? Right, that's another reason why. If, if somebody wants to sell a property that say four units has four bedrooms, you can purchase another property that has more units, more bedrooms. That's another reason why, right? So if you have more units or more bedrooms, do you make more money or less money? More money, right? Can you read the next one? Yeah. This one here, number four? Oh, yeah. Four. Yeah. What does that mean? So keep this in mind, right? Diversify is a good word, but it, it's talking about units. So you can have a building that has all one bedrooms. You know what? I'm tired of having just one bedroom. Too much people move out too often. I need to have two bedrooms so you can have a better, so you can make that decision based on a unit mix, right? You can purchase another property, it can be four units, but have two bedrooms or one bath, two bedroom, one bath, two bedroom, two bath. And I'm going to give you a case study that I, I have done. Yeah. Will that include like those buildings with like a grocery store or something on the bottom floor and then like apartments on top of it? That's right. The same thing. That's correct. That's, that's mixed use. Well, you just create that's mixed use. Question mixed use sector, right? That's a, you did describe another sector. Is that sector residential or commercial? Got it, right? You have learned so much right now, right? Commercial is, now we have another sector, right? The mixed use, industrial, storage, right? That's, that's under commercial. Yes. No, you have to like, um, go into a single property, which means like, it will bring you to the property that might have it. What kind of difference? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then we'll talk about that, the difference. So these are all the different things that you can do, all these benefits from the one that you sold to the one that you purchased. And by the way, now we're, we're not going to be using that terminology anymore. It's called relinquished property, replacement property. Relinquished property, replacement property, right? So when you relinquish the property, and replace a property, you choose one of the seven items, right? It's quantifiable. Can you read the next one? Five? Yeah, improve cash flow, operating financial vectors or debt service, or are Leverage, right? Some people like to have a lot of debt, some people have less debt, but debt is, is good in in investments, because you're gonna re-leverage your equity, right? Just go buy, get another loan, buy a bigger building, it's gonna generate more, more cash flow, you know? So that's your financial leverage. That's what, that's how you can improve that, your income. Okay, uh, how about you? Can you read the next one? What do you think that is? 
property is 500,000 and you buy one that is 700,000, you increase the 200,000 per market. So your wealth increase just by making that purchase, right? You sold a property for 2 million, you bought one for 3 million, the difference is 1 million, you just increase your wealth by 1 million on that transaction. Beautiful, right? And then rising rents. That's another reason why a lot of investors make that decision. So this terminology, the exchanger is us, whoever's gonna make that transaction, relinquish property. I just, just told you right now, is a property you sell, it's called relinquish. The property you purchase is called replacement property. And then the accommodator is that third party who is going to perform, perform that transaction. <clears throat> Look at this, capital gains. You will pay 20% if you don't do a 331 exchange. Lifetime property. When we talk about, do you need to purchase a property that's the same one as the one that you sold? What do you think? Let's say if you sold five units, do you need to buy another five units? So that's even more. More, right? It's all about the value. It's all about the value, right? Like kind has nothing to do if this, I have a residential, commercial, commercial, industrial, industrial storage. It has nothing to do with the sector at all. It has to do with the value, okay? Value. Good. Anything that you get cash, you have access to cash, you have to pay capital gains. Access to cash, you have to pay capital gains. Also, debt, right? If you have access to that debt, then you pay capital gains. So let's say, for instance, you sold a property to someone, and then that person tells you, hey, can you give me a loan based on that transaction, like a second trustee? You cannot do that because if you're, you're, you're negotiating the terms, and so you pay capital gains. So you don't want to do that, you know? This is not your friend, okay? <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, what's the minimum for when you exchange a lifetime property? What, how much more does it have to be? Infinity. It's up to how much cash you have or that debt that you want to have. Isn't that beautiful? It's all up to you to see what's your risk appetite, you know? I'm telling you, you're young right now, right? You're just beginning, you're getting in the beginning of your career. Just, just negotiate that loan, right? Remember what I told you? Find out, perhaps you may want to get a five-year loan, like an arm, that's an adjustable loan, seven years, 10 years. Who cares? You're going to refinance and are you going to be paying off that, that loan in 30 years? Chances are probably not, right? You can refinance later. The idea is to grab the property, get it, right? So it's up to you to, when you do a 10 to change, to see how much equity you have on the property, right? So you move the equity to another building, right? And you keep doing that. Got it? Okay. These are the matrix that we usually have and uh, evaluate, but the main though is cap rate. Anyways, what is cap rate? NOI to buy that property. NOI to buy property. And how do you get the NOI? Uh, gross income less operating expenses. Simple as that. GSI, you don't have to say, like, you can just talk to your friends or your investor. What's the GSI of that property? And you know GSI, well, top line, right? Minus reporting expenses, NOI, right? And just divide it by the price. Simple as that, right? We have all the metrics here that you have uh, have heard about it in finance and, and accounting, NOI, right? Was, we already talked about that. Jeez. We call, uh, when you do financial modeling, sometimes you can use it as gross effective income, minus your expenses, your NOI. Cap rate, GRM. This is when you divide the value or the sales price by the income, if you GRM. Usually GRM is like a whole number, 10, 12, 12, 15, 20. So this is one way that you can compare buildings. In Long Beach, selling properties like 15, 16 and, uh, GRM. If you come to Santa Monica, 18, 19, 20 GRM. If you go to South Central, 
9, 10, 11 GRM, you know? Once you do a lot of few transactions and or you have done some evaluation, this is a simple number. Between this one and this one, you can compare properties, very easy, you know? Those of you who do uh, a lot of financial engineering, you can calculate your IRR, you know? And by the way, all these calculations that I do are part of my model that I do. You know, when I change properties, you can quantify, you can use this matrix to quantify those seven benefits that I told you about. <laughs> this chart here is, it blows my mind. The actual rate that you would pay if you do not do it. This is a fact, by the way. If you have a property you own for five years, two years, one year, one month, and you sell it, this is how much you have to pay. This is this is something that motivates any investor to go ahead and do a 1031 exchange. Did anybody, uh, you guys got this printout, uh, the handout? You probably have that one. And this one, uh, keep this one in mind that uh, this is one reason that you can persuade yourself or your friends or your family members to do a 1031 exchange because you would have to pay 20% on the transaction. You have to pay 3.8 healthcare tax, 1.13.3 for sales tax, and recapture depreciation 25. It's insane, right? It's insane. So what's depreciation? Anybody? Once again? Depreciation is a write-off, right? You depreciate your best friend into 27.5 years for 39 years, right? Based on what type of loan you have, you know? So nobody you have to pay recapture depreciation, right? Not on, not on capital gain, but on depreciation. This is this is motivating, right? To do a transaction. For every dollar, you have to pay like 62 cents. It, it, it's, it doesn't make sense, is right? Is it California or is it like, Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, no, but, but I want to tell you that it's applicable all over the U.S. What changes is here and the healthcare too, you know? This one is based on your tax bracket. Most of us, most of us, we're going to be in that 20%, you know, give and take, you know? But this one is going to vary according to the state, but we're talking California, this is a fact, my God, you know? And your recapture depreciation, this is a IRS, 25% that they will, is set this uh, this way. It's insane, right? So this is uh, the exchange transaction. First, you know, you find the, uh, you're an investor, you give it to the accommodator, you do the exchange agreement, you find a property, and then you replace the property. This is a little history on a 1031 exchange, but the bottom line is that the main reason why this was established is like 1921, the Congress set up this rule, by the way. Can you believe how many years? More than 80 years, right? And so a lot of our changes have done, but the concept is, is the same. Seller relinquish property and buy a replacement property, right? So there was a case, this family had Timberland and this family sold all his, his land full of Timberland to this company here, the Crown Company. So the Crown Company sold, gave him all his properties. So they wanted to do this transaction in five years. The government didn't allow it. And as a result of this case, they took the government to court, by the way, and they won. Okay. But before people were exchanging property and they can do it like in five years, the transaction, right? But now this is why they set up this rule that you have to complete the transaction in 180 days, mm -hmm. not six months, 180 days. Because the time that you start performing the transaction, that, that the clock start ticking, you know? And within 45 days, you have to identify the properties, okay? So day one, 45, you start counting the 45 days. 
And then you have the three rules, three property rules, 200% rules, 95% rules. Once that 45 day pass, you have to identify the properties. Once you have identified the properties, then you enter escrow, and then you have 135 days to complete the transaction, and then you re-leverage your equity. So this is the process that you have to do. Okay. These are properties that are not, and we'll get more in detail on the rules, by the way. So you you see, and it's mandatory. You have to meet those requirements. One of the three rules you have to apply. These are properties that are not eligible for 1031 exchange. Can you read the first one, ma'am? Oh, personal property principal. What is that? Like your the home that you live in. Can you do a 1031 exchange? Think about it for a moment, right? So we can put things in perspective, right? We're trying to determine which properties we can do, right? What is personal use property? I would assume the residents live in. That you're right. Not eligible, right? Can you can you exchange that home that you live for something else? For a, another single family home. Or any any other property to do a 10 to one exchange? Sure. As a as the rule? I mean you're just transferring your equity over. That's right, right? You, that, that's the objective, right? To transfer equity. Is it allowed? No, oh, just kidding. No, I just want you to, you're thinking correct, but think the opposite now, okay? These are properties that are not allowed. It's, so, it's a basic concept, right? But this is why they created this rule. So properties that are not allowed are your primary residence. Go ahead. Where do you have a primary residence and move that to the public for a year? Right now you're investing some other property. You know, we're talking about strategy. Being creative. <laughs> See, now, now we're gonna get now we're going deep right now, okay? That that's the talk that we need to have now. Now, now we're gonna go in full force right now, right? How do we how do we go about it, right? You know, but we know for sure that this property you cannot do it, right? So keep, just keep that in mind, right? Right. Read the second one. What is a second home? That's right. Have a house here in California, have a house in New York or Connecticut or Hawaii. Go ahead. How do they know second home from investment? Ooh, so just keep that in mind, right? So this is now we're we're building strategies, right? How do they know, right? Of course they know because it's in your tax return. When you do your tax return, it's in black and white, right? Right there in the address. Okay. Yeah. When you apply, like when you apply, it's probably you probably stay. I'm gonna give you the answer, right? The answer is that every property that's in investment is in your schedule E on your tax return. Remember, you have A, C, you go to E, and there in between there's a lot of forms, right? So in your schedule E. That's where you list all your investment properties. All my properties that I own, they're in my schedule E. That's how they keep track of the depreciation. And that's when you start doing uh, strategies on the expenses. One year can be higher, another year can be lower for the income, you know? Yeah. Well, what if you have like a two unit residential or three unit residential and you want to do a 1031, like a four, but you want to live in one of the units and then you rent see on the others? How are we talking, right? He just described right now like a duplex, triplex, or fourplex, right? You live in one and the other one you rent, right? Okay. That's okay. Right? So it's still so personal use, like you're still living there. Yeah, but remember it's four units now, right? Yeah. Right? So you have income, right? So you, you need to report that if you the moment that you report that income, it's it's already you can do that. Exchange. So you maximize your cash flow at that point. That's you're right. Living there, but then you make the money. From you them. got it, right? But going back to number two, right? What you describe is not a second home, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So can you do a ten three one exchange on a second home? Yes. Everybody know, right? Same page, right? You cannot do primary resident on second home. Got it? 
Crystal clear, right? Okay. Three. Let's do the honor. You and the what does it mean? Not exchangeable because it is for personal use and not for investment. What is a vacation home? I assume a property that you go to during the summer or for. Give me an example of a vacation home. I don't know. We're showing it somewhere close to the sea. Lake Tahoe. I love to go to Lake Tahoe, right? I bought a cabin. <laughs> we go to a Big Bear, right? My vacation home, right? Can I do a ten thirty dollar exchange on my vacation home? You can't, right? You can't. You can't if you go to vacation home. Like, I know if you think about your IRS tax documents, oh no, it just says property. Property, right? Vacation home. In your tax return, then they list your primary residence, and that's an investment that you did. A vacation home. You know, and so there are rules, place. and I'm gonna give you the but I'm gonna give you the answer right now, right? That vacation home you can convert into a, an income property. Mm -hmm. Just put a renter for two years. Put a, a Airbnb, and we'll talk about Airbnb like in a moment, okay? So I just want you guys to put in. We're doing all the fundamentals right now, okay? Can I just? Yeah, that? yeah. So from a tax perspective. The burden of proof is on you, not you. on the government. So you have to prove that you did use it as an investment rather than the government proving that you didn't. That's right. So having it for two years is a good thing. I guess if you, if it, I mean, well, I think the difference between a vacation home and an Airbnb, that the income is consistently coming in from the Airbnb, where not exactly it would not be coming in from the vacation. That would be, that would, that would be reflected in your tax. That's right. Hey, by the way, you're exactly right. It's burden of proof is on you. He's right, right? And we're going to learn even the specific approach to differentiate what you guys just talked about, right? Mm -hmm. To it's the burden, it's burden of proof is on you to establish that hey, I collected income. Right. And so in the year, right, if you collected income, what's a percentage of Personal use versus an investment, right? And I, we have the answer today, by the way. Just give me 10 more minutes and we'll get to that. I can assure you of that, but uh, you're thinking correctly, you know? You in the back, can you read the next one? What is a business opportunity? Anybody? <laughs> I have a liquor store. I have a market. Any of your family members own uh, any businesses? What kind of business? Uh, it's a small grocery store. It's a franchise chain of like is that a, marts almost. I mean, is that is that a business opportunity? Yeah. Can I do a thing to want exchange in that? Oh, we learn something else, right? Anybody else? Uh, yeah. Out of power right to change out of the parts, right? Or to sell to the public, right? That's a business, right? Profitable business, by the way. Is that a business opportunity? Mm -hmm. Can I do an exchange? Can I? Got it? Anybody else? Yeah. The franchise of Juice It Ups, like a juice store. It's juice store. Baba, right? The juice, they sell them. I mean, all this, think about all these places they, they sell drinks, right? Is that a, a business opportunity? Can I do an exchange? Can't, right? Inventory, goodwill, and equipment. You cannot, right? And last but not least, you read the last one if you don't mind. Literary property. What's flipping a property? What is what does that mean? Buying it cheap, fixing it up. Today you bought it for like super cheap, three hundred thousand. You fixed it out with all your buddies and you know carpentry that we fixed it up ready and we sold it for like a million. Oh my god, you made a killing, right? Can you do that to the one change on that property? Why? By the way, uh, Chris, do we have our own, we don't have online, right? Any law students? And this is for law students. We have three. Uh, huh? We have three. Three law students online. 
You're gonna love this one, okay? Ready? Intent. It's all about intent. When you buy that property and you wanna flip it, if the intent was not to have a renter, but to flip it, right? Can you do a 1031 exchange? You can't. So, law students intent, not intended for rent, property was not rented out. Question. So if you flip a property and like, let's say you sell like a million, are you getting slammed with all 16%, like full 60% of taxes or 62.1, whatever it was? Yeah. It's the full. 62.1, right, exactly right. If they have any questions online, just let me know, Chris. You know, I appreciate it. So we got this straight, right? All of us? Yes. What time period if you rent it out? Yeah. That example you just gave is what's her name? Bella. Bella and Chris. What's her name? Yeah. Anthony. Anthony, Bella, and Chris. That's the same thing that Bella and Chris were talking about. Is your the burden of proof is on you. You have to report that income. If you report it, that becomes an investment, right? It's up to you. So the answer is yeah, you can do that. You can convert, right? But you have to be very disciplined to know and to keep track of that income coming in. Because you have to pay taxes on that, right? You have to report that in your tax return. Yes. All right. Is there a certain amount of time you have to pass it before you can Excellent question. And that's what's going to come next. But yeah, you're right. There's a, a, a time period for Airbnb that you, you can do. They allow you for personal use versus an investment. And based on so many transactions that I have done, that I'm going to give you the answer about that. Yeah. So the answer I'm going to give to you is 10% of 14 days. That's the answer, okay? So we're going to have to wait for the slide. 14 days or 10%. How many days in one year? And if I give you 10%, how many days is that? 36, right? 37, 36, something like that, right? So they allow you up to 14 days for personal use or 10%. What's better, right? 14 days or 10%. If you choose the 10%, it's higher number, right? Here are the rules. This is mandatory. If you learn this one, you are ready to perform a 1031 exchange, okay? We're gonna go to a case study We'll take a break, but let's learn this one forever, if it's possible. Ready? Only three rules. Only three rules. Very basic, but you have to know the concept. You have to know how to go about it. Okay? We're going to do a polling question, but before we go into that, this is the three rules here, okay? Three property rule. Can you read the first one, if you don't mind? Maximum of three properties may be identified, no limit on the number of dollars. What do you think? Can anybody tell me about the three property rule? So I sold this building, right? And I have 45 days to identify properties. So I sold it today, and the IRS gives you 45 days to identify, right? Sold it today, 45 days to identify. So the first rule, they have to satisfy. We're gonna pick one of the three, it's mandatory, right? Because there's a form that you have to sign and it's stamp. You cannot go back in time, keep that in mind, right? Day one, you sold, 45 days to identify properties. First rule, you can identify three properties. Doesn't matter which one it is. Doesn't matter when we talk about the sector, it can be a residential, commercial, industrial. It's all about the value, right? But on the three rule, does the value matter? Doesn't matter, right? So just identify three properties that you wanna buy. Question. So you only need to adhere to one of these? That's right. 
you have to, but you have to pick one of these three. It's mandatory, right? So three property rule, you sold the property today, within 45 days, you have to identify three properties. Can you identify property on day 46? How about on day 50? You have to identify before, right? Within 45 days, it's mandatory, right? Mandatory. Okay, uh, you ma'am, read the next one. Me? Yeah. Okay, um, no limit on the number. So long as the aggregate value of the properties identified does not exceed 100% of the aggregate value of the relinquished property. For example, identify four or more properties own value after the limit of the time of sales price of the relinquished property. Right, so the difference between this one, right? 200% rule is that this one, you cannot go over that value. If you sold a property for 1 million, the replacement property, the one that you're gonna identify, cannot exceed double that amount, right? Cannot exceed 2 million. If you sold a property for 500,000, you cannot exceed more than a million. You can identify many, right? One, two, three, four, five, fifty. But it cannot exceed two hundred percent of the value that you sold. Everybody's with me right now, please. So if you sold for like one million, up to what amount I can I can replace? You see the two hundred percent rule. So one million. 200% of how one million is two million. So that those properties you're gonna identify cannot exceed that value. Got it? If you sold it for two million, 200% rule, up to what amount you can purchase? Four million. Okay. Can you identify one property, two, three, four, five, 20? How many can you identify? Whatever is as much as you want, as long as it's under four million. As long as it's under four million, got it? Got that rule, everybody? Give me the back. 200% rule. If you sold it for 3 million, right? How much do you have to, to satisfy the 200% rule? Just 3 million. How much? 6 million. How many properties you're gonna do on 6 million? Up to 6 million. Can you identify four? Can you identify five? Can you identify 10? Can you identify one? Right? So the answer is, can you identify one up to 6 million? You can identify one, two, three. So the number of properties, no limit. Wow. Wow, right? Crazy, right? It's, it's, it's a simple concept, but Digest it, yeah. So how would you do that? Is there, how would you finance? You have to like take out a loan or that, you finance? That was my next question. Like, okay, this is great, but how do you get into it? That's right. You need the money like almost, what, 15 or 10% or not eight, I don't know, whatever. That's why I can A pretty large percentage because if you're gonna buy a million dollar property, like it's insane. It's insane, right? But, but they allow you to do up to 200%. You don't have to go up to 200, right? You can just buy, perhaps even you sort of for 2 million, buy up something up to 2.5, 3. It doesn't have to be like, if you're about for two, go up to 4 million, right? Or that's the maximum. You don't have to go above, but that's up to you as an investor, your risk appetite. You know what? I'm, I don't care about that. I'm all in, right? If they approve my loan, remember what they did on my SBA loan? I'll take it. I'll go up to 4 million. But some people are, risk adverse, you know? Some investors are not that, just a raise of hand. Who is, who, between risk appetite, let's say high risk, risk adverse, low risk. Who's adverse, low risk? Raise your hand. This is, always, this is so interesting, by the way. This, and that's not right or wrong answer right now. I just wanna see the audience here, you guys, or you, uh, okay, so who's risk adverse, less risk? So we have three, Four, four people, right? Four. Who's 
risk. Let's take the risk. Everybody, right? By the way, there's no right or wrong answer here, right? This is when you start building your philosophy of, of investment. You know, you can start making decisions. You know, I don't care about debt. I'm all in. If they lend me the money, I sold for two million. Let's let's go up to four million. If you got twenty million, let's go up to forty. It can be a portfolio of properties, right? If you have a little house for five hundred thousand, you can go up to a million, right? It's up to your risk appetite. This is a good exercise, by the way. This is how you can put things in perspective, right? Can any, anybody explain to me the difference between the three property rule and 200% rule? Yeah. Uh, three property rule, there's no value, no limit value. Uh, and you can only do three properties. But the 200% rule is you can do as many properties as you want. It can't be greater than double of what you sold for. Right. Which one do you like? Three property rule. Why? Because I don't see a world where you sell a one million dollar property and you find ten properties that are only equal to two million. I think yeah. you're right. I mean that, that, that now you guys thinking more uh not like an entry level investor. You're like getting the sophisticated the way that you're thinking right now. You know, go ahead. You see, out of all these three rules, the first rule, the next rate, the excuse, it's the like maximum three properties. Yeah, I think by those three. And you can't buy them and you're screwed on that. Yeah, so exactly. So that's right. What happens if you don't buy one of those three? Let's say you chose this one, right? For whatever reason, you couldn't buy it. I mean, there's a million reasons, right? Million reasons, right? Right? What happens? What happens if you don't buy it? Yes. That's right. Do you see this is why this is when you start building your brand? you are so much valuable as a professional, as a broker to your clients, because they rely on your expertise. They come to me and say, Edgar, you know what? I, I, I need to ex uh, expand my portfolio. You know, and they give me the parameters, you know? I don't go, I don't want, I sold this one two million, but I don't, I don't want to go up to four million. It's just three million, you know? Just find me like, I sold these three units, find me six units, you know? So this is what's, I love what I do. This 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 is your expertise, right? Start calling all your network, all your contacts, look at the MLS, look at public listing, all your connections, right? To try finding property for that client because he's they're relying on you. You only have how many days to identify? Can you can you identify day 46 on day 50? So you gotta do it on the 45 days. And trust me, clients. They're gonna love you forever because if you understand this concept and perform the transaction, you're gonna have a client forever and they're gonna refer people to you. This is why brokerage is beautiful, by the way. Or oh, investment, right? In your family, people in your family can rely on your expertise and so you can perform and execute, right? So, you know, question, what's the difference between three property rule and 200% rule? Right? Right? Simple as this, right? Three property rule? No limit, right? It's three property. It tells you on the on the on the heading, right? 200 percent no limit, right? But it cannot exceed 200 percent How many of you guys want to have want to purchase in your lifetime more than one property? Keep your hand up more than two properties. You put it down when I stop, okay? More than three properties. Everybody still up four properties. Five, six, seven, eight. Okay. I'll go up to ten. Nine, ten. Most of you, right? Question. Do you have a portfolio of properties now? Yes. Yes, right? It's beautiful because we all have this in common, right? By the way, I own multiple properties myself, my office building, some income property. I also own with my family. With my mom, just purchased a property in Long Dale as well. And so I, I have a portfolio of properties, right? 
You can create your own portfolio property. It can be condos, duplexes, can be an apartment building, office space, storage, can be a, perhaps a warehouse, right? Portfolio property, right? Everybody with me so far? So we're gonna go to the third rule. This one's beautiful, by the way. Are you ready? Okay. Can you read the third rule? What's your name? Sonia, do you mind if you do the honors for us? Can you read the last one? What is the first, what's the name of the third one? So we're talking about 95% now, right? And we're connected to portfolio right now, okay? Continue, Sonia. All of us, let's, let's use a simple number, okay? Let's say we have a portfolio of three properties. Let's go easy. The next, let's say, next 10 years of our life, maybe five years, we bought three buildings, okay? Three. Well, portfolio of three properties, right? And trust me, once you buy two or three, on the second one, you start always thinking about the third one. I can assure you that it, when you see that income coming in on a monthly basis, the people are paying rents, pay the mortgage and that profit, your NOI in your pocket. It's beautiful, that cash flow we talked about. Beautiful, right? Once you have two, you go three. You start thinking, you cannot wait for the fourth one. Like right now, this is my clients are thinking this way, like right now, cannot wait for the race to go down and just a little bit, get another one, right? So still with me? Okay. So 95% of it, right? So you're gonna sell those three properties and identify another portfolio of properties, but that list of properties you're gonna identify, you have to you have to buy them all, but 5%. In other words, 95% of that other portfolio, you have to buy. Did I lose you? I'll give you an example, right? Let's say you three three properties. Maybe it's based on value, right? Three property. Let's use three million, right? Three million, right? And you identify another portfolio of property of five million. An example, right? You have to buy, and that's five. That portfolio of five properties. You said five properties. You have to buy ninety five percent of them. So you have to buy at least four four of those properties. It's mandatory, right? So you are selling one portfolio to get to the another portfolio. So that, that's what my clients do. This is the level that I'm in with my clients. You know, when they, sometimes they make decision not on one property, on a set of properties. Have you guys seen buildings that uh, there's a driveway in the middle, maybe 10 units on the left, 10 units on the right, or five units on the left, right? That's a portfolio of like two properties immediately. But they, they reach a point where, you know what? A lot of liquid, I'm going to exchange it for something else, mm -hmm. you know? So we have a polling question right now, but uh, when we'll come back, we'll take the question because I think that we need a break. Let's take like a five minute break and then we'll come back. Is that okay? All right, let's do that. Thank you. So I'm going to show you I just came back, so I was looking at How's school? It's going great. It's going great. Um, you know, uh, Did you send me an email? I did. I did. Oh, wow. It was like a few months ago. And then, and then Yes. I and, and I sent you an email back because I was like, I don't come to campus all the time. Okay, no yeah, no, no, I just want to tell you that. So for the summer, we can do something. Yeah, or you can have this payment about the Austin's or if you have any exciting ones. Oh, is that right? Yeah. So you know, at the end, since you're here right now, um, <laughs> yeah, I'd love to take the time to meet with you. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. Who's your name? I know you put his last name in there. Yeah. I mean, it's like, uh, he doesn't have to do anything. Yeah.
Yeah, I sent you an email because I, I came to campus and maybe I can talk to you before I went to see Mark Macedo in the real estate development class. Oh, okay. Yeah, and so I'd say maybe we can chat for like five, 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. well, um, yeah, February 7th, share with us. Yeah, that, that's what that's the sun and then. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, if I have something in the spring, I'll let you know. Yeah, but yeah, the summer for sure. So, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, I have you set up actually yeah. some. Okay. And you also have a book here. Okay. Yeah, so. Yeah, please. Awesome. Yeah, I said to myself, yeah, it's like, oh, thank you very much. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. 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 I want to connect. I love yeah. that. Yeah. I'm so happy that you came back. Of course. Very much. Awesome. Yeah, this one was pretty great. Is there more of these? Like, are there any? Lecture slides? So, 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 I really have no bandwidth to post this. So what's going to happen? I just want to put you in charge. I have a question. Give me a chance. Yeah, I'm going to I'm making a slide. So I'm gonna do I'm gonna make your mom's situation for that day. I'm gonna I just want you to follow up with him. So is that feasible or should we do not? Um I want to talk to you. Time wise, resource wise, I have time to do this. I can do this. You would you feel comfortable like doing that? Oh yeah, absolutely. But I need to like maybe a humor. Yeah. I don't know. Like, Expectation of like what what exactly you're supposed to do. Okay. Because I can do it. Okay. I just need to. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay.
like nothing like no oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 again like you know time sure you just like, 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 hey, like, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna email her and let her know about the Okay, cool. Okay. I you're going to want to drag it into Cali. But obviously, it's not really in terms of like box. Yeah. Are we okay? Ready? We have uh, about an hour, you know, that we can uh, talk about this case study. We'll talk about Airbnb, <clears throat> more rules, but basic, the major rules that we have to learn is three, these three rules, uh, 1031 exchange, you know, the three property rule, What's the three property rule? Um, That's right, three, right? Yeah. And we have to identify between first day up to what day? 45. 45 days, right? So they want three properties up to 45 days, right? What's the next rule? 200%, right? 200% rule, we have to identify as many properties as we want as long as we don't exceed 200% of the value of the one that you sold. Today, you sold one property for a million, you can replace or identify up to 200% 2 million. Within what time period you can identify? 45 days, right? Same thing, right? Day one, this is super important, right? What I just, I'm telling you right now, so we can go look at a case study, some polling questions that we're gonna learn. Okay, this concept, right? Day one, three property rule, identify within five days, right? I want this one, this one, this one, right? Three property, if you choose the three property rule, right? Or you can choose 200%, I can choose this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. Many, as long as you don't go over 200%, right? In 45 days. Mm -hmm. So we read day one, 
this, right? So on day 45, how much more time do we have to complete the transaction, right? It's mandatory. You have to complete. Remember that the history of 1031 exchange, the Stucker case that they took the government to court because he wanted to do it in five years and the government told him you cannot do that, right? So because of that case, these rules are in effect. It's 180 days. That's right. So let's do the math, right? Day one, we identify three properties. Day one, up to 45, we identify up to 200%. Or the, th three, the third rule is day one, you sold your portfolio, and 95% of the property you identify in another portfolio, another one, right? You have to purchase that 95% of the portfolio in how many days? 45. Same thing applies, right? <laughs> Three property rule, 45 days. 200% rule, 45 days. 95% rule, 45 days. Yeah, we're on the same page, all of us, got it? And now we said that we have to complete the transaction in how many days? 180 days, right? That's right, that's correct. She said, does that include the 45? The answer is yes. So if the answer is yes, on day 45, how much time do I have to complete? Huh? 135. Cling, cling. Right, 135. By the way, twinkling is the keyword for saying um, that's part of the test at the end. But yeah, so just remember that. And this money that you give when you do the transaction, who's holding that money? What's the name of the person who's holding that money? It's a mediator or accommodator. Accommodator, intermediator. Twinkling. Gonna be the test, right? The end. So who holds the funds on your behalf? It's who holds the funds? Accommodator. Or at intermediate. Accommodator is known in the industry. Everybody in the back, you sold the property, you cannot have access to the cash. <coughs> who holds the funds on your behalf? Huh? Accommodator. Who holds the funds? Can you hold the funds? No. Can you hold the funds? Why? Because you are not the accommodator and you have to pay capital gains. Wouldn't that be the same as an escrow? This is happening simultaneously at the same time that you open escrow. Escrow officer takes care of the transaction on behalf of the seller and buyer. The accommodator, remember that exchange agreement that I showed you guys, that you signed, is given to the escrow. And so that transaction happens through escrow. That the whole concept is still the same, nothing has changed, right? But you have to empower that accommodator to represent you. Just remember that agreement that I showed you guys, and it's in your handout, by the way, a copy of it. That agreement you sign, you empower the accommodator to be you, <clears throat> like an agent, right? By doing that, you don't touch the money. Let's go back in time again, right? So you sold the property and you chose the three property rule. How much time do I have to identify the property? How much time? 45. Everybody, 45, right? How about if I choose that 200% rule? How much time do I have? 45 days, right? If I choose the 95% rule, how much time do I have to identify? So simple, right? Can you identify in day 46? Can you see the stress for a client on day 44 and you haven't found nothing that you want? <clears throat> You're stressed, right? Why? Because you have to pay all that capital gain. That's so a question for you. Do you start looking for properties when you sold a property on day one? Why? Why? 
45 days is nothing. 45 days go so quick, right? This is why I love what I do. I love going to my, I cannot wait to get into my office, start making the call, see what's happening in the market, look at the, start doing my searches, you know, anywhere in the, in the US. Do a 1031, do it in California, right? So start looking for property that can satisfy one of these rules and something that my clients like, you know? Based on, remember the seven benefits? Anybody remember the seven benefits? Why somebody does a 1031 exchange? One of the benefits, anybody? Better location. Better location? More units. More units? Yeah. Newer building? Mixed. Diversify, mixed use, right? So yeah. all those are benefits, quantifiable, based on numbers, by the way. You see how beautiful it is now? You can put things in perspective now. So you don't start on day one, start looking now. Like right now, let's say if you make a decision, you and your friend save some money, you know, all of you guys get an LLC, start looking for properties now because the opportunities come. I'm telling you guys, right, please remember, don't worry about the rates. When the rate opportunity comes, you grab the opportunity. I'll give a little, a little footnote, okay? Just a little story, six seconds. I purchased, this is many, like more than 15 years ago, a condo, no, 12 years ago, a condo. One of my clients came to my office and said, you know what, I got laid out from Northrop. I'm an engineer, I want to go out of state, yeah. but I cannot pay my mortgage anymore. Do you see the opportunity? What <laughs> 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 you Oh my God, I, 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 my heart just skipped the beat. <laughs> I am serious. Can you talk about assumable loans? Right. What did I do? I told lady, ma'am, her name is Alicia. Alicia, you know, I can assume your loan. Don't worry about your debt. I'll take care of your debt. I, I think I couldn't wait until the next morning to call the bank and find out first bank. You know, my client in order for the mortgage, but I want to assume the loan if they're away. So they asked me to put 5% down and I assume the loan. I got a beautiful condo, one of my investment property, which is rented, nice cash flow. Beautiful, less than 400,000. It's, it's gorgeous, rented. I never intended to move in, you know? I mean, on my plan. So if I, the opportunities always come, yes. So when you assume a loan like that, do they not make you change the rate that they had locked in previously? Isn't that beautiful? Did you hear what you said right now? They cannot change the rate. It's only you, you, she already signed the, the, the note. It's like you sign a note, okay? Like 50 pages, whenever you buy a property, remember me. You can get ready for like, to be there for like an hour, two hours signing all kinds of documents. Sometimes you don't even read, no, you're signing, but that's the note. You have the answer, yeah. The rate is already set. They just you're just assuming liability, adding your name to the note as the as a new owner. They require sometimes they require you to put a down payment, but it's nominal. Five percent they require. Remember, I, I took all the money from the bank. I think I left like a penny in the bank. <laughs> I didn't care. I saw the opportunity. Remember, we talk about uh, you guys are take risks. That's a risk I took. I mean, there's, there's, there's so many bad things that can happen, but I, I didn't pay attention to that. I just pay attention to, oh my God, I have a property here. I could, I wouldn't be able to afford if I wanted to. I assumed the loan. I only pay 5%. Get it? Yes. Say it again. Why do you I know, right? That was tempting. And this is before this, by the way. See, I, I, I did. You know what? You know, in retrospect, perhaps I would have done maybe the three property rule. You know, get that equity out and find maybe more. But I didn't do. I want to tell you why. The decision. This is when you can start your philosophy investment. When I saw a brand, I can, oh my god, I can get twenty eight hundred dollars in my pocket. <laughs> You know, because she doesn't, she's not in real estate. She retired, 
going out of state. She doesn't see what we see, the opportunity, right? So that's the reason why. Like, uh, whatever. Cash flow. Yeah. Cash flow, baby. Cash flow, right? On off. Think that she moved out like two months later? Did I ever move in? Zero. So my she schedule just, E. Huh? She, she walked away with nothing. Yeah, but, but she's, she's happy. She's a happy. I know. But... Why is she happy, Cameron? What happened to her liabilities? Question. Yeah, so you you literally just paid 5% down. You didn't pay her for her equity in the property or anything like that? Peace out. That's crazy. I, I just want to tell you that opportunities, there's always opportunities that come in your lap. I just want to give it, this is a fact. I'm telling you, I, I own this in Torrance, this, this con that I own, okay? That's one of multiple properties that I own, okay? So it's possible. You just have to be alert. Just be alert. Be alert, you know, when the opportunities come. And the opportunity will come. All of you guys are take, can take risk. Take it. Take it. Buy one property, re-leverage. Refinance that property or get a second trustee and buy the second one. Do it. Time is on your side. Right? Okay. So this is an example of one client who came to my office, owns for units in Westchester, just nearby campus, by the way. I saw it for 1.50. So just think about this, right? This is a case study that we're gonna do. Imagine if you have this much money, you sell this property, what kind of building would you buy? Actually, let's do that exercise real quick. Let's say you own this property for how long? Five years. Right. By the way, this is this are facts I want to show you right now. Okay, you own swap this property for five years. Okay, you sell it for this much. Once you paid your commission, my commission, cost, and all that, it'll be a little bit less. And we'll, we'll we'll look at the numbers, the actual numbers, but just keep that in mind, right? What would you buy? And keep in mind that you have to satisfy the proper rule, forty-five days. 200% rule. Portfolio, no, because he only owns this one. Okay? One of those. So, what would you buy? Um, maybe some mixed smokies. Like what? Retail on the bottom. That's mixed use. That's sector mixed use, right? If you have an affinity, if you like that type of investment, it's, it's great. You know? What would you buy? Maybe a cheap office building. You got enough money, you can find something, maybe small office space somewhere, two offices somewhere, right? The family, uh, I don't know if they have any debt. They do. And we'll talk about the debt. Keep in mind, right? Remember, we can borrow more money as well, right? <laughs> so you can buy. If I do that 200% rule, up to what amount of money can I buy? Can anybody, anybody do the math? What's times two? Three, three How much is that? 3.1. Yes. It's nice, right? Woo, right? So you can do the 200% rule or the three proper rule. You had a question by the way? Yeah. yeah. So I just wanted you to put in perspective, you know, a study, something that my client did. And this is a conversation that I have with them, right? When he came to me and he told me about wanted to do the 1031 exchange, what was I doing on uh, immediately? I haven't even sold the property yet, right? I started looking, looking, because on day one, the 45 days come so quick. Okay. okay. So what I do is uh, let's take a polling question. All of, um, did, did we send to the uh, to the laptop the polling, or we can just do it manually? No, no problem. Online, uh, they can see it though, right? Online can see, yeah. Okay, that's good. So let's take a polling question here. We'll we'll have fun and we'll learn a lot, you know. And I have the answers right here too. Actually, in your handout you have the answers, but uh, let's let's do it together. 
Okay, if you acquire a property with a quick claim deed, you guys know what is a, a quick claim deed? Let's say grandma, grandpa passed away, your friend, someone gave you the property, you know? That's, you sign a quick claim deed, right? So they give you, how long must you own the property to do a 10 to the one exchange? So how long you have to own that property before you do a 10 to the one exchange? Let's say somebody, your grandma gave you this two units and you wanna do a 10 to the one exchange? Do you do it it's right away in six months, one year, two years, three years? Anybody? Zero. Zero, anybody else? It's one of these answers, by the way. Think about this, right? They give you the property, right? But you want to do a 1031 exchange, right? How long do you have to wait until you find more properties? You want to buy more properties, right? And it happens a lot, you know, in families. Grandma passed away, they give it my grandkid. Here, I'll give you these two units. To your question right there, do you have to like, couldn't just, just sell it, right? And find another property? So you can do that, right? But how long you have to wait? Two years. So you have to show that you've been renting the property. So as long as you own the property for three years, and you have been renting the property for 24 months. So you sell the property, <laughs> Today, right? You rent it today. You cannot do it tomorrow, the next day, at 10 You have to wait until, you know, 24 months later, and then you can just do the transaction. Otherwise, it'll, it'll show that the property may be a flip, you know, and you don't want to do that, right? Here. Chris, do the honors on that one. Can you read the question? Can an Airbnb be used as a like kind of property to exchange in space? What am I trying to ask right here, right? So we bought a property with Airbnb, right? And you want to do a 10 to one exchange. Can I do that? Yes. Who says yes? Who says no? Okay, most of you said yes. Mm, of course. Right? Can you, can you read what it says right there? Oh, as long as you're documenting your time. Show the income that is required. We talked about this before, right? As long as you document that information, right? Okay. Uh, you in the back? Yeah. Does the IRS find what am I asking about them? You have to tell the IRS. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> So let's say you purchase a property, right? For Airbnb. That means that it's for rental, right? So I'm asking the opposite right now, right? I'm asking in that rental that you bought for Airbnb, right? Can I go and, and stay a few days there? Get it? So you have the Airbnb platform, you put it Airbnb, you want to rent it out, right? But it's a nice property in Lake Tahoe. And I'm going with my friend, my family for the weekend. Can I use it for personal use, right? That's an example, a, a vivid example. Pause on that question. So you probably can't rent that to yourself. Say it again? Say like you rent it to yourself. So you're paying it. You really pay yourself. I feel like the same, same answer would apply. By the way, uh, you, 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 your way of thinking is very advanced, we, and, and it's legal, by the way, as long as you show the income, right? of course. But you just find the loophole that you can, the answer, yeah, you can do that, of course, right? But now we want to use it for personal use. We don't want to waste our money. It's our property, right? But I just want to go to Lake Town for a few, day, for a few days. I want to go to Big Bear. You know, maybe you have a condo in Santa Monica across the street from the ocean. You know, anywhere that you have another investment property that's through Airbnb, can I use it for personal use? Who says yes? Okay, how about the class? No? Okay. 
Who said yes? Why, Chris? Because it, I forget the exact number, but there's a certain amount of time that you can use for personal use as long as I think it's a, the majority is for business use. Correct me on the percentage. Actually, I gave you guys this uh, guys the answer about an hour ago. Yeah, it's like it was like do you remember? 10%, 10%. Excellent. Or days of the month of the year. Excellent memory. You in the back. For personal use, so Airbnb for rental, right? So can I me it's only a rental, but you know my tenants move out, you know? Yeah. Bless you. Person, That's right. So you just want to go to a week. Maybe it's a beautiful property in the mountains. Oh my God. I, I just want to go and take a break for a week. Why do I have to go to a hotel? I got my own property. Can I move into that property? It's an investment though, right? Remember we talked about we can personal use, we cannot use, right? Yeah. Well, it's fine, but dollars. So hold that time, you're right. So we're gonna go one step further, right? More than a week is fine, right? So I ask you, so how much longer you can move in? And we already gave you the answer right now. Like 30, 30, 60. Ready? But but you're still with me on the scenario, right? Airbnb, investment property, maybe it's not personal use because remember personal use is your second home in uh if it's a primary homes, it cannot be a 1031 exchange, right? So it's asking right here, okay? Can I use it for personal use? Ready? Yes, you can, right? Follow that trend. Can you read the next question? Does the government allow for the for their corporate What do you think is the answer? I think, yes, I think 14 days might be the limit, so you got it. She said 14 days might be the limit. The answer is yes, but now we're going to take it one step further. Ready? So we know that we can move into Airbnb for personal use. We know that it's going to be up to how many days? Got it. You're still with me, right? You bought it for investment property. And then you want to go to the mountain for 14 days, okay, a week, two weeks, that's fine, right? So far, so good, right? So it's allowed, right? What does it say here? So what's the difference between this and this? Which one's higher? Why 10% is higher? There's more potential it's 10 percent like if you rent it out 300 days out of the year then that would be 30 days which is greater than 14 days yeah. everybody got that one can you tell me that in your own words the difference between this and this 14 days right 10 percent more leverage like he says right it's ten percent of the number of days in a year. So how many days in one year? Three sixty-five. What's ten percent of three sixty-five? That's right. We choose the higher number: thirty-six point five or fourteen. So it's ten percent higher than fourteen. It is right. So that's your answer, right there. I can assure you. What you learn right now, 10% of that industry do not know this. This is where you start building your niche, your uh, differentiations in, in doing strategies and how you execute, making decisions, because now you know more than your competitors. Now you know more than your investors. See how you can start building, you know, part of your tool set, you know? Little information is powerful. I love information. By the way, this may uh, give me a good opportunity to share with you. It's in your handout. I read this book all the time, by the way. These are all the rules and you can find little things like this, okay? So I encourage you guys to, if you don't want to get, check it out in the library, but this book is fantastic, by the way. It gives you 
Everything I'm telling you about is right here, okay, in this book. Going back to the, the, the answer here. So if the property is rented for less than four, 140 days, you still get 14, 14 personal days. Questions regarding that? Okay. Do the honors with the next one. Does the government allow 10% of the time that is rented for personal use? Yes. Why? I mean, we just discussed how you can either 10% or 14 days, but we wouldn't go with it. That's right. So, so I just asked the question backwards right now, right? So just to confirm our knowledge right now, right? So if you rent a property more than 180 days or 200 days a year, you now get 200 days, 10%, right? So therefore you 20 personal days, right? 10%, right? Instead of 14 days. So it's beautiful. You could, a lot of investors are doing purchasing property through Airbnb, you know? And by the way, you're gonna see also tons of transactions going on this year on this, because a lot of investors, they put in the platform. Is everybody familiar with the platform, Airbnb platform? Yeah. How much do you know about platform? Okay, so tell me a little bit what you know. <laughs> That's exactly you yeah. put in the platform. They uh, if you want to make extra, you know, you can do like cleaning, you yeah, know, sir, yeah. clean and all that, you know. But I think it's a great uh, um, this, this innovation was not here like 10 years ago. Imagine the uh, What's going to happen in the next 10 years? There's going to be new platforms that you can use. It's already starting to morph into different platforms. That's right. That's only that, that's one of the most recognizable, right? Exactly. But yeah, go ahead. I've seen people rent their house out for 14 days. So I know if you have 14 day period, you don't pay tax for the 14 days. They use that against their mortgage. Golly. You, you're you're thinking process very sophisticated. The answer is yeah, you're right. Can you repeat it one more time what you said right now so everybody can hear? You rent your house out for days. Well, you know what it is is that that's your personal use, right? You know, any money that you made, of course, you have to report it. You know, a hundred percent, right? But it's personal use, right? Yeah. Now I feel that you guys are not entry level investors right now with. You are more on the sophisticated, especially now that you know that you can uh, accept risk. Go do some leverage, you know, go ahead and apply for a loan so you can buy more properties. Question. There's also uh, an app called VRBO that's like basically Airbnb, but oh. it's just for standalone houses. Oh, is that it's right? Like shared spaces. Oh, so there's already like more of that like out there. It's pretty big. Oh, is that what's the name? VRBO. Have you guys heard of? Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. You heard about that platform, everybody? What do you know about it in the back? Have you heard? What do you know about your platform? It's for houses, right? It's like a vacation. It's like vacation. It's like vacation. That's right. Yeah. It's beautiful what's happening. I mean, it's sort of an innovation, right? Yeah. Me personally, um, my idea was to go into more Airbnb and things like that. But yeah. because of the rental laws in California are changing so substantially, yeah. it's making it. Uh, very difficult for homeowners. Yeah. Um, I am working into content rental, so you can come in and rent for like a certain amount of time to do your podcasts or your fitness videos, or whatever, yeah. and then you're done. But I don't have to worry about like unlock the tainer actions and yeah. things like that. So, but I think people are running out of space to do that. They just want to come in and do their whatever video, whatever they want to make for themselves, and then they're gone. So That's you could probably, I think, out of the time of in, in a day, rent that out more than you would mostly, like, likely make, you know, tenant. I mean, you make more money. Yeah. Coming in and out. That's exactly right. And you avoid, like you said, and I don't want to deal with unlawful detainers, right? Do you so guys know what is an unlawful detainer? Law students, unlawful detainer? Eviction. Somebody doesn't pay rent. 
you have noticed to move out, they don't move out, you take them to court, you start a proceeding, a novel, they need a proceeding, and so you start the eviction process. You know, so you file a case against them and it takes like about two, three months sometimes. Oh, it's like not the out. case now. It's and more it, like six months. <laughs> in law school, months. eviction, you can have a lockout. They don't even show up to court. You know, by, if you get the judgment, you actually get a restitution to the premises instead of a, a the accusation of the premises instead of money judgment. But then the trick that they're doing now is that they don't show up to court 24 hours before they file bankruptcy. Oh, they're no longer a bias. They then cannot bias do that. The left, so that means that the UD continues. You cannot kick them out. Well, they're supposed to take the, that supposed, that was the case back in the day, but you no longer can do that. Yeah, so so basically, there are so many. And by the way, just a little, let's pause for a moment because there's a moratorium in Los Angeles. That the, you yeah, cannot, I actually work in that, and that's why you know. Like, yeah, it's, it's, it's another it's issue different. right now. They extend, by the way, they extend the moratorium, like if you want to get rid of your tenants, you know, they extended, it was supposed to be due like January 31st, like two days ago, my investor were calling me, Edgar, you know, raise those rents. You cannot do it yet and it because also they extended on, it to the March 31st, but continue. It also depends on like if you're in LA County, LA City, it also depends on um, which, if it, if it was a COVID law attached to it, if there, if, so there's a lot. That is of, like, very true, but, but but it's still the whole California now is rent control. That's the bottom line. You know? Well, every city had and every has, part of every. That, that's why it was so confusing. For that's me. exactly right. A city and then the state and then um, you know then there's like little sub cities in the, the city. They all had like different rules and that's it exactly right. Making it very confusing for the court system. So how about this? How about let's just not go there. And basically, <laughs> and find basically, another way to make income. Yeah, and basically the idea is you're right. The idea is that uh, they see investors like uh, just big people against the real people, right? You know, and so as long as you are knowledgeable about the rules, you know, then it's all about getting knowledge, be updated with the situation, and continue. But don't let that defer you from making the investment. If you see an opportunity, take it because that's part of owning property. You know, you have to. The risk reward that the reward is higher than the risk. Take it as long as you are a very knowledgeable investor, you know, and, and take it. Life is not perfect, right? Life is not perfect. Just make that decision and continue, right? Thanks for your comments. I appreciate it. Having said that in the back, uh can you read the next one? So you have to show that the Airbnb is Second home renovation loan. Mm -hmm. Yes. What does it say? Yes, you have to show the government that this is not your first time residence, second home renovation loan. Right. Like Chris says, right? You have to just document, you know, just make sure that it's, you know, it's not for personal use or second home rental. Remember? You cannot do a 1031 exchange if it's personal residence or second home. Go to the next one. Thanks. Is there a requirement for an Airbnb to be done for the next five days? That's like a trick question, right? What do you think? Who says yes? Is there a requirement for Airbnb to be rented 365 days? I bought it. Airbnb is a rental. It's mandatory. I have to rent it for a whole year. Do I need to rent it for a whole year? What do you think? Who says no? Excellent. You can have seasonal properties, right? Right? Like a cabin, rent, lake, lake rentals, as well as the sub properties, right? Right? So, excellent, guys. So, this is the agreement that you'll sign with the accommodator. Here's an example. These are the benefits that we talked about. This is the reason why people are changing properties right now. We talk about this. Here's a case study of my client. You know, they, he owns those four units. Now he wants to purchase more and have a portfolio of properties. Four units, right? I talked to you about unit mix. You have two bedrooms, three two bedrooms, three two bedrooms, and one 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 bedroom. 
I sold it for 1.5. My loan balance is 240, right? 6.5 rate. My cap rate is 4.75. Question, how do you calculate cap rate? Anybody? Huh? NOI divided by? And how do you get your NOI? GSI, gross income minus what? We accrued expenses, operating expenses, right? Equals NOI, right? Got it? And so you see, you, you have all these variables, right? So 1.5, sales cost, 144,000, minus my loan balance. How much do I have left? Right? This is money in your pocket, but you cannot put it in your pocket because you pay capital gains, right? Who gets this money? Huh? That's right, the accommodator, right? Why the accommodator have to get this money? That's right. If, if you touch it, triggers the sixty two percent capital gains. Yes. So you only be able to buy property worth two point three seven two. Uh, it's basically two hundred percent. That's right. Not well, let's do, let's do the exercise. I did this, right? 1.5, right? 200% rule up to what amount can, I, can we buy? Anybody? 3.1, right? So with me, how about if we choose the three property rule? Up to. Up to what amount? Okay. Infinity. Oh, I think it's okay. The three property rule. As many properties up to that. Okay. No, 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 continue. Oh, okay. I thought you can purchase as many properties up to that 200. That's one rule. You're right. Right? So 200% rule, you can go up to what amount? How much? What amount? 3.1, right? We're on the same page, right? How about if I choose the three property rule? Up to what amount can I buy? Any value. Any value, right? How many properties can I identify on the three property rule? Three. Okay, excellent. How many properties can I identify on the 200% rule? Anything, right? Got it? Okay. Right. Question. Yes. So, like for two hundred percent rule, for example, is it based off of two hundred percent of one point five or one point five? One point five. That's the sell value. Yeah. Question. So, say you're a broker and you eventually come to a point where you want to start taking home some of this. You would just on one of these deals when you sell it, you would just pay that capital gains tax and not do a ten thirty one exchange, and that's how you earn that. Active income. That's right. You pay what percentage do you pay? Sixty-two. Crazy, right? And I just want to tell you, twenty-five percent of my clients in my past transaction, they have chosen to do that. Why do you think? They prioritize cash flow over their equity growth. That's a good answer. Give me another answer. They don't care. <laughs> you don't, but it's 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 so Why they don't care? They don't care. Huh? Why they don't care? They're financially stable. You got it. Yeah. And who's financially stable? General speaking. General speaking. Uh, is somebody in their twenties and thirties? Somebody in their fifties? No. Seventies? Maybe. Most likely, right? That decision is so easy for them. It's no headache and the I I have like 10 buildings. I want to enjoy my money now. Now, right? Go ahead. So is this 62%? Did you say that's the minimum or the max? No, it would be based on those those four taxes, right? Those right. Taxes, right? Remember the four taxes? But in the example, was that that was the maximum? That example, that would be the maximum. 62 for one dollar, you have to give up. 62 pennies. Like it's crazy, it's right? Like it's insane. Crazy. Go ahead. So, yeah, yeah. so if, if you're keeping on engaging in these exchanges, then how do you as a broker then earn 
commission to make someone who's fearless. So you got oh, I love those questions, by the way. It hits my pocket. <laughs> do, do I care? I still gonna do the transaction if they do a 1031 exchange, right? If they don't, I still gonna make my money half because I'm going to represent them in the transaction. I wanna sell their buildings. Yes. The answer is yes. That's how. And by the way, remember we talked about Chris said one, three, up to three percent selling side, buyer side, right? Imagine, imagine when I do a 1031 exchange, how many commissions I get? Right, right. Thank you. I, I get commissions on that right. replacement right. property. Also on that acquisition, right? Relinquish and replacement, right? Isn't that beautiful? It's, you, you do four transactions, it's, it's right? Because you have to represent them in the replacement property, right? So I sold that relinquished property, make commission there, right? They still need to find another property, right? We made an offer, accept it. I represent that replacement property transaction. Get it? As a listing agent, you know, selling the relinquished property. As a selling agent, we call it selling agent, as a buyer. So one transaction I represent as a seller, the another transaction is a buyer. One more step. This is what, when I wake up in the morning, I have a transaction. Ah, oh, I get so happy because, are you ready? Listing agent, right? Sell the property I make. What happens if, if I already have a client looking for that property? My client. That's what's called dual agency. Now I'm representing that seller and the buyer on that transaction. Isn't that beautiful? Ka-ching, ka-ching. Ka-ching, ka-ching. This is why it's beautiful to own a brokerage firm because you have control of that. You have agents. Of course, you can have agents. They can assist you. You can you know, have a, an agreement with your agent and you can give some percentage as well. But the concept behind is you can really, it's very profitable. Save money in those transactions and you can buy your first building. This is this this formula works. I'm telling you, it works. You have control over it, you know? If you take that choice. Go ahead, two questions. Who was for you? Um, I was wondering if, like, I own a property in California and I want to get the cash out of it, but, it, I, mean, but I don't want to pay California taxes, whatever, is it possible to do a 1031 exchange to more tax on the state and cash out of Anyone in the U.S.? This code, the, the IRS 1031 code, is applicable in the U.S. So so you can bring money to the, the, all the states and, and make that transaction. But is, there, is there a law that you can hold the property first after a tax and we'll talk about that this by your this is one of the questions where I'm gonna give the answer. Relinquish property, right? 45 days, identify, 135 days, you process 180 days. So now you have a re replacement property, right? You sold that relinquished property and you have a replacement property, right? So your question is how long do you have to wait to I I, I wanna sell this one now, right? You can keep doing another 1031 exchange, right? You can, immediately, right? But if you want to sell it and get the money, remember we had the, the answer that one of the questions that we asked for 24 months, hold it for two years, and then you can go, go your way. Get it? That scenario that you describe right now is when you have a, I want to take it one step further. You're still with me, right? LLC, right? You have a group of investors, your mom, your sister, your friend, investors, right? You did an LLC. But for some reason, you know what? We're good friends and all that, but you go your own way. I go my own way with my money. You live in good terms. You have to wait 24 months before you make that transaction. You can dissolve, you can dissolve that LLC in 24 months. Would I pay those out? Like say I had a property in California and I did a country on exchange and exchange it for a property in Texas. And I want to sell that property cash out. Would I pay California taxes on that property taxes? Because you, you're on your on your tax return. Remember, 
I'm not a CPA or attorney. I have disclosure because you know I'm just uh, teaching you right now. I'm not providing you any legal advice. Nevertheless, the answer to your question is yeah, it's based on your where you do your tax returns, right? It's in your the address is right there on the first page, right? So yeah, so you have to apply intelligence. Good question. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, so you said we're postponing capital gains tax transaction. Yeah. So defer and postpone it. Actually, postpone is a better word. I like that word actually. Postpone defer is a synonym, but I like postpone. Continue. Yeah. So you're postponing the capital gains, right? Yeah. Taxes. So then, what are you paying? Say you do like several transactions. Are you paying gains on? The last property it as a whole or not until you cash out with the that's what I'm saying what do you pay when you cash out 62 percent of everything or is it everything even the recapture depreciation it is so it's, then why yeah so then why would you just delay yeah or you're you just delaying what you're paying, so you're just hoping this down is the road. Like this is why people don't forget. So, no, I, I just <laughs> want to tell you, you just described right now Vanderbilt's, right. Rockefeller's. Right. They've been doing this for generations. Pass it to the next one, and the next one, and the next one, legally. Those tax loopholes are set for those people. Well, it, it, I just made that example, but they have, we're the same, we're human beings. We have knowledge, our brain, just learn how to legally navigate. It's only about navigating the system legally. This is, we, I'm not saying anything wrong. This is just the facts, just navigate it. Remember I told you 25% of the industry, they don't know about this, because they don't want to bother with it. You know, it's, it's amazing that, they don't want to apply their brain too much, but we are smart here, you know? We're going to school, we're learning so much, right? Skill set, going to take all the classes, and you learn, you practice what you're learning, plus the experience. So, so the answer is, is you can navigate the system to create wealth. Remember the classes, wealth creation through real estate 1031 exchange, right? We, we got to the essence of the class right now. The essence of the class is wealth creation. Go ahead. Um, so after you do a couple of conversions and you just and then you decide to sell that house, are the taxes you're paying on that most recent purchase or are they on the original house that you have? Well, you know what? It, on on the, the actual that you're selling, because you have to recapture that that depreciation. If you depreciate it like year, two years, five years, ten years, you know. So let's see what we did here, right? So look, this is beautiful. Look, I, I, by the way, I I I uh, represented this this client, this couple. You know, look what I did. I I this is what, I structured this deal. I got them four units in plus in you know, some Alamitos. You know, it's it's a nice area in in uh, Orange County. But look what happened to the unit mix. Now he has all two bed, all two bedrooms. It's a they here in the front are two uh, two townhouses. Two units and then two units in the back, plus garages in the back. I love this building, by the way. Down payment, we only use how much money do we have? Okay, let's do the math now, guys. Calculators 1.8, 1 1.186. We got money, right? So now we're gonna purchase this one. Down payment. How much money left we have? Calculators. What's 1.186 minus, somebody can do the math? 480? I'll give you the answer. Look what I did. I diversify his portfolio. Got it? All right. So we use 480,000 from the 1.186, got it? So we got, I found about this four unit building, down payment for 80. So this is 40% of this amount, right? 
This was like a deal that I did, you know, cap rate 5.5. And we got a loan. Remember we talked about loans? It's okay to get more, more it's leverage. We leverage your equity. This is this is the definition of new. Re-leverage your equity, okay? 720. So now he has this building. Do we still have money? Yes? How much money do we have left? Seven or six. Nice, right? What did I do with that seven or six? Three units in San Pedro. Pedro's coming up right now. We don't have to stay in the same area. We can stay in that area that you want, right? We got three units in San Pedro. These are two units here in the front. Huge two bedroom and one in the back with garages, right? This is on uh, up, uh, two blocks west of Gaffney. It's like nice, nice area up in the hill. Pretty nice. So with, with all the money, we're all in. Yes. How can your client like afford both of these loans? They were having trouble on the first loan on the home you sold it. Okay. Let, let's, all of us, let's be on the same page of financial engineer right now, okay? Let's talk about assets and liabilities, okay? Just to answer your question. Let's go to the, the original. How much is my liability? The loan? 240000 right? What happens when I sold this property? What happened to the 240000 Did my liability go up or down? Down, right? I, I sold the property. There's no, there's no more debt, right? It's like starting fresh to your question, right? So now it's up to the client to see, hey, how much debt do you want, right? He was all in. He's like you guys. Edgar, just re-leverage. Just whatever I can qualify, get it. But beautiful thing about it is like, there's no, there's no debt, right? Anymore. He just, at least has debt in the other area of his uh, assets, but his liability decreased 240000 right? So he got a loan. Look at the loan he got. So to your question, right? how can he qualify for this loan? Easy, right? <clears throat> because when you apply for a loan, they give you 70% value of that income. So first is up. So the property has to make money, right? So they give you 70% of that income. And then basically, if you have a salary, you have a job, then they consider that as well. But mainly it goes, it's all about the income of the property, you know? So he was still able to qualify for another loan, 394. See? So he re-leveraged his equity. Look what happened. So now he has, how many units that he has now? This is quantifiable, by the way. Better location, right? Newer buildings, right? Seven units. Remember, he had four before, right? Better unit mix, improve his cash flow. Look at what happened to the market value here. He increased his wealth by how much? 750,000. And more debt, but more debt means more cash flow, right? So you need to have some debt to create more cash flow. This is mandatory. So this is a relinquished property. This is a replacement property. So he got one property, 1 1.2, 1.1. His debt, 720, and the other debt is 394. Okay. This is down payment, right? 1.186. Remember, we talked about how much down payment he has. So he chose, he made a decision not to buy just one, he bought two. Question, would you have made the same decision or how can you change this decision that he made? Would you buy uh, more units or perhaps a third building? Can you do that? You can do that, right? 
there's enough money right here, right? You don't have to put like 706,000, but maybe you can cut it in half. 303 or 303 or three, you follow me? But he put like a large, large down payment, 60%. So this property location got better. Look at the, what happened to the year built. The Relinco's property in 1949, the replacement property got newer buildings. See, 78, 78, 79. He sold four units. He bought four Relinco's property one, Relinco's property three. He got three units, total seven units. <laughs> and look at what happened to the unit mix. We talked about the unit mix, right? Better mix. GSI, right? Your effective income. How much we was collecting before? How much was he collecting before? Income. Seventy nine thousand nine hundred twenty. GSI, right? How much is collecting now? Six seven. And seventy one. Right. Nice, right? So increase. This is quantifiable, right? Operating expenses, right? He increases expenses, but his NOI is still better. Look at his NOI here, right? So now his per market market value got increased as well. So the funds went to the accommodator. He hold the funds, and then he, this is uh, his cap rate. So basically, the Lincoln's property. Mortgage term. Look what happened to his mortgage. He had a high mortgage, six and a, six and a half. He got two loans, better better rates. Remember, you, you don't have to do a thirty year fixed rate. You can do like an arm loan. It's it's a lower rate. You know, you can do five percent, four percent, six percent. So his, his debt is cheaper now. See. So this is a calculation I did on depreciation. And basically this is something that is in your head now that if you want to learn more about accounting, you can uh, look at the, uh, the calculations here. If he didn't do this, remember we talked about the 62%, uh, if you cash out, look how much money he would have to pay. Almost 300,000 if he didn't do that transaction. So his portfolio increased by three quarter of a million dollars by doing that transaction. This client that I have, he's super happy with me. You know, I can now two nice buildings, more cash flow is collecting. His wealth increased to 750,000, you know. This particular client right now, he's ready to sell this too. I cannot wait for those rates to come down. <laughs> Do you think I'm waiting on day one? This is, this is uh, if you guys see me within the next uh, two, three months and the risk have come down, please ask me about this one because I'm working on this on this deal right now as far as finding pro identifying properties because I don't want to wait on day one, you know, because he wants to increase, he wants more units now. He's not happy with this now. It, isn't that amazing? Like it, 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 it's, it's nonstop. Once you see a taste of what you can do, Let's, do, let's get bigger and bigger. That's what he's doing, you know? So we have our second uh, polling questions here and we'll touch base and we'll, we'll do a summary of what we discussed. Uh, we have uh, a few minutes and I will go through the polling question here. Uh, let's go in the back. Can you read the first one? I'm sorry. So, so, I'm sorry. Can you sell the property that is in the trust, you know, and buy a property under the trust? Basically, that's, that's what that is. So you cannot do that because it's under the trust names. When you go buy a property, you cannot buy it under the trust name, by the way. 
you have to be under your social. So you cannot buy under the trust. They, they don't lend you money on, on the, under the trust name. Can investors go their own separate ways? We talked about this before, right? So we have a group of investors. They want to go their separate ways. They want to dissolve the LLC. Dissolve, you know? You could just replace that person. Uh, you have to dissolve that entire partnership. You can do that, but you have to wait. Add another member, taking one member off. You can do that, yeah. But this this question is basically just dissolving, you know. In <clears throat> you have to just wait two years, and then you can dissolve. You can go your own way. Can investors uh, sell their relinquished property and buy a replacement property and hold hold money back for capital improvements? Investor cannot hold funds back, right? They cannot touch the money. Can funds from the seller proceeds relinquished property be used for recurring expenses like a one-time cost to pay me, the broker, to pay the target title insurance escrow? You can do that. The answer is yes. Can investor sell to a related party? Yes, you can do that. Can the seller Property carry back a loan. We talk about this today. You cannot do that because you you have a control of the terms. You cannot do that. And those those questions and answers are in your handout, by the way. Can you go apply for a equity line? You cannot do that. This is the question that I get get asked at least twice a week. What does it say there? Can the seller the relinquished property move into the replacement property as a primary residence? What do you think? No. Why? Because it's a primary residence, right? There's an exception to the rule. If there's a divorce or death or you can you can do that. That's the exception to the rule, by the way. So this is the book that I always recommend for you to, uh, to buy. And question, you know, real quick, the seven benefits, from the seven benefits, which is the benefit that you guys like the most? The cash flow. Cash flow? What's the other benefit? More units. What's another unit? Another uh, benefit? Unit mix. Location. Mix. Location. What else? Rising rent. I'm sorry? Rising rent. That's right. Give me two more. Fair market value. Ooh, I love that one. That's what happened here, right? We increased. 750,000, the wealth increased three quarter of a million, right? So market value, right? Went up, right? Hey, Andrew. Yes? I'm sorry to jump in on you, but we are right on time. Okay, so that's the last one? Yeah. Okay, last one. And the last one? I'm sorry? Um, cheaper debt. Yeah. So please remember that. Good motivate. I want to send you the positive energy to do transactions. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to teach you a little about 1031 exchange. And see you next time, guys. Thank you. 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 Thank you.